uh, to this. Ah, good, you just saw the recording started up. So that's good timing. Thank you, Darlene. So uh, some things that I need to say are that the National Academies is um, committed to the principles of diversity, integrity, civility, and respect in all of our activities. And another important thing to mention is that uh, this open session is not, quote unquote, a public session per se. It's really designed for the Nuclear Radiation Studies Board, board members and staff to uh, have conversations with leading experts, to explore new ideas, new pr potential project ideas, and those of you who are attending either virtually or in person uh, are free to um, gather this information, listen in, and Darlene will be posting later on the website the video recording so people can watch it later as well. But this is really designed for uh, Nuclear Radiation Studies Board to explore new ideas, new topics, things that could turn into uh, projects that we could work on at National Academies. So I just want to just make sure everyone understands those expectations. I also want to thank all of our panelists for the three panels coming up. Uh, the Nuclear Radiation Studies Board covers three topical areas. You know, we cover radiation health effects. We're going to have a panel on that toward the end of the afternoon. We cover nuclear waste management topics. That's our first panel coming up soon. And then our second panel will be more on our nuclear security non-proliferation uh, set of activities. So um, really looking forward to these panel discussions. I also want to thank our various uh, board members who are going to be moderating and sharing these panel discussions. So I'm going to next um, turn it over to uh, Paul Dickman and Monica Regalbuto, who will be co-chairing, co-moderating the panel, first panel, on applying sustainable principles and practices in radioactive waste management and nuclear decommissioning. And it's uh, fantastic that we got three leading experts from three European countries uh, today. And I, I know it's in the evening for them, so I also want to appreciate them uh, making the time when it should be kind of their time off to relax and and have a, have a drink or whatever they will typically do in the evening. But um, we'll put that off for the next hour as we uh, will listen to them in this conversation on this very interesting topic. I also want to mention that the biographies for all of our panelists are posted on our website on the agenda. So we won't have time to uh, describe uh, their distinguished biographies uh, here today, but you're free to look it up on our uh, agenda on the website. So over to you, Paul and Monica. Oh, okay, great. Well, I'm going to start off just by uh, saying that this is an interesting topic that I heard a lot of last year when the IEA held a, a large decommissioning conference. And the top one of the whole sessions really was talking about the concept of circular economy as it was being applied towards decommissioning, particularly in Europe, where what we saw was a lot of organizations uh, from a policy level really looking at how to do beneficial reuse of materials from the decommissioning of nuclear reactors. Now, this is absolutely foreign to the United States. We don't we don't do any of that. In fact, we don't do a very good job of recycling in anything, but but particularly when it came to decommissioning materials. So this was a great topic, and Monica and I both have waste management backgrounds, and 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 she she along with myself, we got enthusiastic about the idea to, to learn more about how our colleagues in Europe in particular are able to move this topic forward, given given there's a lot of constraints that Europe has. So this was a great opportunity. So that's how I'm gonna tee it up. Monica, it's you now. Go ahead. Well, thank you. So first of all, welcome to our three uh, participants today. Where we recognize this, uh, you know, different time zones over there. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Craig's uh, son for loaning up a laptop, which is also very much appreciated. So today we have uh, three speakers and uh, we're gonna uh, start with a little bit of some opening remarks from each of our speakers. Uh, feel free to use uh, slides if, if you like. And then we'll do some uh, Q&A afterwards. So our first speaker is uh, Craig Ashton. He is a Waste Services Director for Nuclear Waste Services in the United Kingdom. And uh, 
Uh, Craig, if we, I don't know if you have slides. Um, I'll, I'll use them if, if necessary. Did you say, okay. uh, Monica, that Feel you free. want uh, you want just an opening um, intro first, yes. rather than get into the the Q and As that you, that you yes. turn around? Yes, that'll okay. be great. So, just a bit of context for everybody. Then, um, in two thousand and five, the UK was found itself in a precarious position. We had about a tennis tennis court's size um, capacity to dispose of our uh, all of our low level radioactive waste because we only have one facility in the UK. So, at that time, the default position was put all of your radioactive waste, regardless of level, into a into an isofreight. Uh, a metal container, um, try to super compact it, squash it if you can, get mm. as much in there as you can, and then we will add some grout to it and dispose of it in the one facility. And it was getting very full. Some of your colleagues from the States came over, uh, URS Corporation, and did a grand job of changing, helping us change our approach. They put a bid in, um, and what we effectively did was set up a waste services organization. That, that was what I was involved in, in establishing. And we started to divert waste away from disposal. Now, the large majority of that was what we term low active, low level waste. So this is waste that are less than 200 becquerels per gram. But because of the low levels of radiation, these can actually safely be disposed of in more commercial hazardous landfill sites. So we, we diverted a large chunk by doing that. And then uh, some colleagues that, that you'll hear from uh, in, in Europe as well, we utilize their, uh, their expertise uh, for surface decontaminating and if necessary, smelting metallic wastes to get them free release so that they could be recycled along with all of the metals. Um, and then the incineration as well of, um, of, of more uh, soft wastes that, that you get from decommissioning plastics, air fed suits, that, that, that type of stuff. And what this resulted in is we avoided the need of having to build a second low level waste repository in the UK mm -hmm. that saved us about two billion pounds. We've already extended the life of the current repository by, well, we think it'll see us till the end of our mission. So another hundred years, we'll get out of it. And we've already had in-year savings uh, over this to the consigners of about quarter of a billion pounds. So that, that's where the UK is at. Thank you, Craig. Um, let's now uh, go to Patricia uh, Beckhouse. And Patricia does have some slides, if I recall. And uh, she is the radiation protection expert at the Department of Safety and the Environment uh, from the Dutch National Institute of Public Health and the Environment. Yeah. Uh, Hello to you all. After uh, this great introduction of Craig, I just have one slide, so I need to... <laughs> Let me share my screen if I can. All these troubles. Where? Yeah, Darlene's looking into it. Oh, here we go. Great, great. Thank you. <laughs> I don't. That this is. Uh, it's a bit of a delay, but I think yeah. Hey, there yeah, we go. Yeah, we see it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me. Right. So. Um, well, he hello again. Um, I'm from the Netherlands and I just showed you a map for where that is. And in the center of the Netherlands, there is an institute, the Dutch National Institute for Public Health and the Environment. And that's where I'm from. Um, our institute is giving us, it is providing advice to governments, to our government. And so it's not a commercial business. Um, but but to elaborate a little bit more on the Dutch situation, we have, as in England, we have one uh, 
place where we store our radioactive waste. And all the uh, artificial or man-made waste is going over there. And, and it's low-level waste, it's uh, middle-level waste, it's high-level waste. It's all going to the same in the same direction. And besides that, we have landfills. And uh, landfills for norm, natural occurring radioactive material, if it's uh, up to 10 times the clearance level, the generic clearance level, you can go there. And um, we started in 2018 with uh, specific clearance or conditional clearance and giving, you know, providing the opportunities for a lot of normal materials to go to the landfill as well. So we do not have to send all that to our only storage facility in the Netherlands where the other uh, waste is going. Um, so for us, circular economy is... Uh, is a thing we want to do because we said in the Netherlands that in 2050, we want to be circular. Well, that's a nice goal. And uh, so even with our radioactive material, we are thinking in that way, uh, not mentioning, not giving the scope of uh, perception or economics or whatever that takes to, to get to that, uh, to that goal. But so this is just, um, short introduction of the institute that I'm working and the situation in the Netherlands. I think for now that's enough. Okay, thank you Patricia. And our next speaker is Arnie Larson and he is the Technology Manager Strategies and Partnerships for Cycle Life in Sweden. Thank you very much. I will see if I can start my, my video. No, start my, my sharing. Uh, so, do you see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Oh, oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to, to, to be in, in your meeting. Uh, we are very proud of what we have developed over the years in Sweden when it comes to, say, recycling and working towards a, a circular and sustainable future. Uh, I have a few slides. If we start from where we come, uh, the operations in Sweden was from the beginning a state-owned research uh, company, which then has developed. And from 2016, we are part of the EDF group, the, the French big utility. Since the EDF group decided to invest in managing the full life cycle of nuclear power plants, from construction up to, to managing the commissioning and, and waste management. And we have sites in, in the UK, and in France and in Sweden for, for treatment of materials and waste. When, when we come, to, when we enter the area of clearance and recycling, uh, we're looking into three areas, the four areas. We would like to preserve resources. Uh, we would like to have a short way to material end state because too many countries have no uh, repository in place and, and the disposal is decades away, uh, and it, there's a big risk that you have to recondition because no one remembers the content, etc. So we would like to, to cl close the circles. Uh, we would like to save repository volume. And this, at the same time, we would like to become circular and not only make clearance and recycling, we should avoid the downcycling so materials can be used again and again and again. And the, the picture to the right is from the Swedish Foundry Association, which we are a member of and have great discussions on, displaying that, that an iron atom can have, have a long journey over the centuries. When it comes to clearance, uh, uh, dif different uh, approaches in different countries, to a certain extent, it depends on what is the alternative mm -hmm. and the different marginal costs, which are affected by regulations and uh, and disposal conditions, is the repository available? Is it surface repository, geological, et, et cetera? But not at least the operator mastery, because nuclear power plants, which have been in operation 
for long times with fuel failures, etc., will generate complex waste forms. As I said, we would like to, to reduce the relative waste volume and we need to, to reduce the need for virgin material. Having a look at what we are doing in Sweden, uh, we are treating materials, large components, uh, scrapping containers, etc., from the entire Europe. It's received by, by on, on a, sorry, uh, it's received on sea or on, on, on trucks to the facility. Segmentation, decontamination, which is the key in everything, melting for homogenization, sampling assessment, and then uh, recycling of the, of the metal. The metal becomes a resource instead of liability. And then to return the, the waste to the country of origin if we're doing services for other countries for safe disposal. Our average uh, recycling rate has been in the order of 95% of the metals shipped for treatment. And currently our company, we're doing uh, services to 15 European countries. Just two uh, case studies to, to end up with. This is an example from the Swedish nuclear uh, power plant Ringhals, uh, where we have treated in total nine uh, steam generators, each 300 tons, huge components to, to manage. We have a clearance above 70%, and 99.9% .9 of the reactivity has been transferred to, to the residue, residual waste. And so it means that almost nothing remaining in the metal and it's for safe recycling. We are recycling uh, back to the conventional industry and we achieve reduction, uh, volume reduction factors exceeding a factor 10, maybe 20, 30, depending on, on the topic. The second case study is something really special because in France, uh, there have been no acceptance for clearance until now. So it's recently started up that that metal can be treated subject for clearance and recycling to the conventional industry. So this is the first product ever of French nuclear power plant material which have been recycled. 100% of, of the uh, metal uh, melted in, in the ingots have been recycled into new products. And as per, per law, the residues have been returned to France for disposal. Our conclusions, based upon our almost 40 years of operation, uh, we think this is safe, it's reliable, it is really sustainable, and it's transparent. We have an open door policy. There should be no secrets uh, about this. Thanks to that, we have a good dialogue with the, with the steel and metal industry. The material, it is trusted, it's appreciated, and it's well characterized. We are doing XRF analysis of all the material, and it has a high quality, so it's recycled into new products. Thank you very much for the... For Thank you, Ari. So maybe I'll, I'll go to Paul to uh, get us started. Yeah, uh, thank you. These are all great. And again, it kind of highlights the difference between what the U.S. does and, and what Europe does. And so really part of my question, well, I have several questions, but I'll start off with one of them very clearly. So, you know, within the EU, you guys have, have really come to a point where this is becoming acceptable. Right, and and your your governments and your regulations and regulatory authorities have have adopted this. Is there an opposition to this continued effort, or 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 really? I mean, I, I bluntly, I think Europe is much more engaged in terms of of accepting recycled material in all forms. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think this is a this is a, both a social, cultural, and and obviously regulatory process. So I'm kind of curious to see your own views as, as to seeing this, uh, how does this emerge as an acceptable pa path forward for, for decommissioned material? And I guess I'll, who do I toss this to first, Craig? <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think the, the regulatory environment in the UK has gone beyond trying to just encourage this. And the example I'll give, so that, um, 
this, this is verging onto the the whole circular economy and sustainability side of things. Uh, Arne uh, put up the um, the graph earlier. You, you'll all be familiar with the the ALARP, the optimization principle, and that kind of sits around everything that we do. We'll, we'll apply the waste management hierarchy, reduce, reuse, recycle, where it is practicable and optimal to do so. And we use a concept in the UK of gross disproportion. So for where the hazard and the risk is deemed to be high, you can pay up to 10 times more to, get, to, to manage that level of risk. But where you've got low levels of risk, obviously you should be at more of a two to one, one to one uh, cost ratio. So we've had an example recently where part of the UK's decommissioning uh, sector have had some low active, low level metallic wastes. If you remember, I said that these are the things that we've started to divert to other cheaper landfill sites. And this organization put together an optimization case which said it is grossly disproportionate to treat this waste. It is unsustainable to treat this waste because it will cost them 5,000 pounds a ton to treat it versus 500 pounds to dispose of it. And it's very low risk. So they use that mm -hmm. argument. So Paul, back to your question, it got stopped it got rejected by the regulators. And they did exactly what they should have done. They said, have you considered the full life cycle costs and benefits of recycling your metallic, that metallic waste? Or are you just looking at a gate price at the back end? And it's, so we're, the, the, the circular economy and sustainability are solely reliant on looking over the full life cycle. And our regulators are uh, actively encouraging that. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I, unfortunately, in the United States, we'll, we'll uh, lower waste uh, is uh, is available and uh, um, relatively inexpensive. But uh, anyway, I, I'm curious to see, uh, Patricia, do, uh, do you have similar uh, views on this? Um, yes, I think within the Netherlands, uh, if we can separate the, the radioactivity from um, the metals, like what Anna was just explaining, we send it to Sweden and it comes back. The metal we see as, as cleared. It's The levels are below clearance levels, so there's no, no discussion at all. This is just normal metal. We can just use in a normal way. And that counts for everything. Also, if it's a concrete or whatever, as long as it's below generic clearance levels, it's not a discussion at all. If it becomes above the clearance levels, and even though risk might be very low in conditional ways, then then it becomes complicated for a social or economic way, but a social social uh, perspective. Um, yeah, for the example, an example of concrete, if there is a little bit of radioactivity in there and substances and and people feel that their house is built with concrete with radioactive substances nobody would agree with that and the the, the companies selling concrete are very scared of that there might be a business uh, starting off with with using concrete coming from well, some some fault or some reactor or whatever, which which might still contain radioactive substances. That that's that's a very complicated situation in a perspective way. Technically feasible, but socially no. Not yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it was interesting because this idea of of the regulator saying you must consider the full life cycle. Uh, I think uh, aren't in your in your presentation that was clearly that was part of what what you were talking about too i think yeah uh, it is and and uh, I, I think we we need to be better and if we should 
have nuclear plants in the future. We, we need to manage the, the full life cycle. We need to, to recycle. And we also need to recycle back to our industry materials because to, to recycle out today, it's well accepted. But do we accept recycled material back into to new build projects? That's a more complicated question. And when it comes to, to acceptance, I would say that in Sweden today, it's a demand. You, you have to recycle unless you have good arguments to send it for disposal. So, so this, it, it has changed over time. And we have a lot, had a lot of discussions with the metal industry. And it takes a few, few meetings to try to, to mm -hmm. explain what it is about. That, that is the, 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 the question. Because we're talking about non C, virtually we're talking about Becquerel's. And they are just scratching their heads. We, we need to compare with something and, and what does it mean? And if we are saying that the maximum dose you can get from recycled material is less than 1% of, of what you get from, from the natural background, then you have something to, 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 to compare with mm -hmm. and such things. So, so to spend time to and, and try to, to meet people so you understand each other, it's, it's key. Annika? Yeah, maybe I'm, I'm going to ask the board if they have any questions before I ask the next question. Maybe Darlene can uh, help us check online. All right, so uh, let me uh, continue. If, if anybody has a question, please raise your hand. Or, uh, there's an electronic hand. Okay, Charles. Yeah, thanks, Monica. Thank, thanks, uh, European colleagues. This has been great. So I'm trying to think about when we've, we've, you know, talked a good bit about so far on metals uh, recycling, reuse. Are there other opportunities in terms of other types of materials that are not metallic um, that could be um, you know, brought back into the system and and not going into whether it's a landfill or some disposal system, and and so there's there's that type of question. I'm also thinking about designing uh, nuclear facilities from scratch and uh, designing as a way to uh, design with circular circularity in mind, uh, or is, or your countries also uh, applying uh, that for newer facilities. Thank you. Maybe I might answer that one, <laughs> if I may. Um, yes, well, within the Netherlands, uh, the nuclear power plants, we just have one small one, and we have another even smaller one, and we're not into um, dismantling nuclear power plants. But if I can change from, from nuclear to radioactive, I want to like uh, to give an example of, of cyclotrons and mm -hmm. cyclotron volts. Cyclotron mm -hmm. volts, and I'm I'm not I'm only well let, let's say the one that pro that produce uh, radiopharmaca, so not the one used for therape therapeutic use, but uh, in, in hospitals, but the the radiopharmaca production, um, neutrons will activate the concrete of, of the fold. And this concrete, if we look at activity concentrations, is not that high. And moreover, the radionuclides that we talk about, they're mostly Europe, uh, Europium 152, uh, cobalt 60. They have half-lives that are not extremely long. And therefore, we might use them. And, and thinking about lifespans of, of material, um, if it's in a circular, circular way, we have one lifespan, second, third, etc. Uh, but because these half lives are short, we might use this uh, concrete as granulate and and replacing the raw materials that normally is used in concrete again. Mm -hmm. This means it's it's a kind of down cycling. It's not the best top, best way, but at least it, it is something. And th this concrete we can use not for homes, 
well, there might be other possibilities and, and the activity will, will drop before actually it is uh, used as, as construction material. Years have gone by and activity will get lower and lower. Um, it's not about activity uh, concentrations only. It's about risk to, to have this, uh, to have a license to do so. Within the Netherlands, it's a struggle. And it's a struggle we mm. are doing right now. There is one license uh, uh, provided from the authorities and where it says that the, the concrete coming from a cyclotron vault is is accepted not as uh, being radioactive waste. Um, what do I mean with that? Radioactive waste means in our definition that it has to go to a disposal site or storage site. Uh, so we do not call it radioactive waste, we call it radioactive material. And mm -hmm. in this case, it was licensed as, okay, this is radioactive material that might be used for recycling, but we still have to prove, you have to demonstrate that we stay below a certain dose. And this dose of, because it's artificial, it's 10 microsievert a year for citizens, which is a very low dose, but so scenario calculations have to be done there. Um, so it's an, it's an example. And, and uh, also for the construction, there was the second question, construction, you can reduce waste if we, if we construct the vaults in a different way. If we use other concrete, concrete which does not include cobalt 59 or European, um, so activation will not uh, give as, as high uh, activity concentrations for, of these radionuclides. And also construct it in a way that the inner 50 centimeters, that's mostly the, the activated part, uh, we can remove that easily. So instead of having, well, walls of cyclotron volts normally might end up to two meters thick. Uh, that means 50 centimeters activated, one meter 50, which is just normal cement or concrete mm -hmm. so to separate that in an easy way which is which has not been done in the older cyclotron vaults it, there's just it's just one block and there's mm -hmm. a third thing in construction <laughs> uh, being very practical now is uh, um, in English is what the uh, reinforcement it's called yeah reinforced yeah. Yeah. reinforced concrete so you have this yeah. iron and if you have metals in your concrete, that will activate more than your concrete does. So mm -hmm. an advice would be, if it's possible, not to use these reinforcements within the first 50 centimeters on the inner side of your vault, yeah. Yeah. your walls. So it's all practical, very practical information <laughs> of ideas mm -hmm. that we have. And, and within the Netherlands, if new vaults are constructed, these are the ideas that they will try to do so. So uh, uh, walls that can easily be removed the, the inner 50 centimeters easily be removed, not using any reinforcement within this 50 centimeters, and use concrete that does not contain a lot of cobalt and europium. Yeah. So that's a, a practical answer to the question. Oh, very good. Uh, yeah. Could, could I, yeah. could yeah, I ask, uh, add on that, that also in, in the international agencies, etc. I think the metals are considered that, that they are a good practices when it comes to recycling, but there is a big discussion now ongoing regarding concrete, what to do with all concrete mm -hmm. for decommissioning and yeah. how, how to take benefit of it instead of having a liability around this. So I would say EIA, uh, NEA, WNA, and a lot of organizations are working with those questions now to see how to do this in, in a reasonable way when it relates to costs as well, because it cannot be too costly because then no one would use it. So a lot of good initiatives ongoing. Yeah, just to add to that, Monica, and, and I think yeah. it's a great question. There is so much innovation going on in this area right now. Mm -hmm. um, some wacky ideas that are going around. Could we, uh, the concept of concretine, could you start putting graphite yeah. in concrete? To re does it half strengthen it? Graphite batteries. 
could you start using the fly ash that comes out of incineration or do some thermal treatment on resins and asbestos and use them as um, encapsulant material rather than use raw materials? And then uh, another biggie that, that we've done in the UK, don't create the waste to begin with. We've just mm -hmm. passed a policy recently which says yes. if it's in the ground already, you've got structures in the ground, leave them where they are. If you can make a safety case to safely shut the site by leaving it there, because it's pointless digging it up, transporting it halfway across the country to put it in another hole in the ground. And mm -hmm. But as, as Arnold says, the big thing that everybody's considering around all of these, though, is the life cycle. Is it worth it? Because you're actually introducing more energy into the process and different yeah. types of, of waste and actually this is why again it's back to that life cycle thinking is critical mm. thank you Greg I did see Alison uh, hand up yeah thanks Monica and thanks to everybody in the panel this is a really interesting discussion and I agree that um, you really do have to think about the costs of this whether it's really worthwhile or not um, I'm wondering if you might have share some best practices, especially about handling um, sort of the pushback that you would get to recycling these materials. Um, one of you mentioned it a bit in terms of, you know, people worrying about building houses with these materials, but I, I'm wondering if you could share some best practices that you've learned along the way. Should should I start with the metals, maybe because sure. I think we are fa we are facing a, a lot of discussions of this over time. But but you need to spend time. You need to, to, to put it into context, and and then also obviously the environmental organizations they 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 they, they make a buy in. Of course, they would like to know more, etc. Et but they think it's a good way to, to manage this. Uh, as long as it's safe, because it's about safety. Uh, but we need to preserve our, our planet. That, that's the, all of us. So I, I think we need to meet, we, we need exchange, and we need to respect each other, because we have different uh, views on, on things. But, but if we meet in a good way, then it works. That's the Swedish experience. Mm -hmm. If I can try to provide an, an example, which is possibly a little more closer to home, for the American colleagues, um, you actually have what we're now considering to be possibly a best practice on your doorstep at Oak Ridge in Tennessee. If you're familiar with the Bear Creek yep. metal smelt facility. Mm -hmm. So you provide a unique service, actually, which we don't see happening anywhere else in the world. And, and Arne uh, mentioned it earlier. We're spending an awful lot of effort to use metallic waste because uh, it, it seems to be the most topical to clean it and then put it back into the general recycling environment. Now, in the UK, the UK exports about 8 million tons of clean metallic waste every year. And the EU as a whole exports an awful lot of metallic waste to the point where they're starting to think, should they control that? Because it all disappears to the Far East or to, you know, less clean facilities um, to be thermally treated, smelted down, and then transported back. We're very, very interested in the, the Bear Creek concept, which is, well, if it's all going to get smelted anyway, do you need to do all of the pre-treatment? And actually, could you start to put more higher active wastes into the process, blend the waste, and produce products that could be beneficially reused in the sector? So could you start putting out the back end? I think Bear Creek produced shielding blocks. But mm -hmm. there are other things. There's shot media that could go into heavy concrete. There's rebar that could go into the footings of your new reactors or your disposal vaults. This wouldn't be clean metal coming out the back end, though. It would be what we term conditional release. It'd be safe, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't be clean. 
And it's it's that mm. sort of uh, thinking that, that we're doing at the moment. Maybe Pretty I could sure comment. Uh, maybe I could comment on that, Craig, because that's interesting. Because we have in Sweden discussions: could could we take benefit of the methods which are a little bit higher in activity for for for, for the, the the insert in the in the, the spent fuel canisters? Because if you have, have spent fuel which are on several sieverts, a few becquerels, it doesn't matter. So, uh, and it's it's a good material, but it contains a few becquerels. So I think that there is. There's a lot of topics to discuss, and it's about optimization. That's uh, our experience, and we all need to talk to each other and, and find best solutions. Patricia, would you like to add any comments? Yeah, I think uh, on the metals, uh, we, we agree that we have good uh, opportunities for the, the, the concrete I was telling you about. Um, looking at the, the concrete business, only the volts from cyclotrons, like a drop in a bucket, it doesn't do anything. And it and commercially, uh, if it's worthwhile, well, there is one commercial uh, party that thinks it's worthwhile who wants to start, and there are others who think this is a very bad idea just because mm -hmm. of the, the image that the concrete business will have. So they worry for their their image. So it's not uh, it's not that. In Holland, we agree on something in here. No, there is a lot of discussion going on on this. Yes. So let me uh, ask, uh, check uh, the board if they have any additional questions. Well, can I, I go see. back to a quick point? Yeah, yeah, go uh, back. Uh, it's okay. So, oh, well, sorry, Charles. Let me butt in ahead of you here. Uh, so I guess I'm getting to this question about the ability for within the EU to have a common standard on free release. And as you know, I mean, most regulatory environments are, are local and national and there's, there really is a lot of cases there's not that much harmonization between them, but is there, is there an effort to kind of harmonize your, your concept, particularly like on metals or, or, or beneficial reuse of uh, contaminated uh, materials? I love the difference between a radioactive material and radioactive waste that you made. That was a great, that was a great comment. So, I mean, is there an effort to try to harmonize this within the EU system? Maybe I, I could comment on, on this uh, and, and say that, that we already have, because we have the, the European basic safety standards where we have the clearance values and, and we have European Commission recommendations when it comes to condition and clearance. With that said, there are certain variations from country to country, but, but in general, I would say Europe is pretty well harmonized on this, mm -hmm. with the exception of France uh, today, but, but France is com coming on board. So, so we will be have the same more or less uh, throughout Europe. And and those standards for clean release were maintained, by the way, when the UK left the European yeah. Union. Yeah. That was actually one of my questions. <laughs> so. Are there Anyways. any additional questions over there, Charles? Well, Charles does. Okay, go what? ahead, Charles. Yeah, actually, it was good timing. I'm glad Paul went first because it, it, it kind of dovetails with what I want to ask about. And I think it was alluded to one or two of the speakers earlier mentioned, um, you know, work through the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, um, in terms of, you know, looking beyond the European system uh, and it, those basic standard, uh, the safety regulations and whatnot. Uh, are there opportunities for um, taking lessons learned from your various countries and from Europe and uh, applying it to the rest of the world. I mean, it'd be wonderful if we get the whole world on board with uh, circularity and, and these principles and applying it across the board. And I, I also do appreciate, you know, uh, Craig's calling out what's going on in Oak Ridge because, um, you know, obviously here we are, at the Nuclear Radiation Studies Board at the United States, National Academy of Sciences, and uh, one of our core sponsors here is the Department of Energy's Office of Environmental Management. So we're thinking about how can we learn lessons from all of you and others and other countries, and then apply it here in the United States and uh, to make a more effective 
waste management and decommissioning system here in the United States. So what that, and it doesn't have to be particularly even in the United States, but I'm thinking about how to apply it in different parts of the world, uh, you know, Africa, Asia, Latin America, et cetera. Thank you. May Maybe I, I could comment on, on that as well and saying that, that when it comes to general clearance, there is a worldwide uh, safety report or, or guidance on, on clearance, which was presented, which was published, I think it was last year or if it was early this year. There is a work ongoing now uh, when it comes to conditional clearance, uh, also within the EIA. And there is a report to be published, I think it's next year on that. And there is a work starting up here uh, later this year when, when it comes to, to circular economy and sustainability, also with people from different parts of the world working together. So there are good progress on the, those items. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add um, the we tend to use quite a lot the waste management symposia in Phoenix. That, that mm -hmm. happens on an annual basis to to share best practice. However, I do think there's mileage. I don't know if anybody there yeah. does have any influence over that, that. But I know that they tend to have like a host country, don't they, or a lead country. Maybe we turn that round and have like a lead theme. Yeah. And maybe think about circular economy mm -hmm. and, and, and radioactive waste management treatment as, as something that, that, that it could focus on I don't know that I think that'd be useful because I, I know what you're saying there's yes there's all the IAEA there's there's various things that go on but I, th I think Charles correct me if I'm wrong you're after something a bit more practical learning from experience Absolutely. And Craig, I like that idea, having attended a few of this uh, waste management symposia. Um, you know, I, I know I think France recently, I guess a few years, a couple of years back, Canada, you know, there have been uh, Japan, you know, some leading countries like that, country theme, which is great. But I, I also like your idea of having the circularity theme. Uh, it'd probably be an easy thing to get the waste management symposium leadership on board with. Yeah, so uh, Paul is uh, very influential in that board. So I am sure we can propose uh, that. We did have a couple of sessions uh, a couple of years ago, but I think uh, making it more of a formal team. That's, that's I a agree. Great idea. Yeah. Well, Monica, I really like I, uh, it. Yeah, I hosted mm -hmm. a session on that last time, and, yeah. and I thought it was very good. But I like the idea, particularly of, you know, rather than finding countries to host, but coming in with a thematic like that, I think it would be a great idea. Yeah. The reason why, why this, in, the, I have a lot of interest in this topic is because I work with the Japanese on decommissioning of Fukushima, and they have, as you know, six reactors and a lot of material that, to be honest with you, they're going to have to deal with. And uh, Japan doesn't have Lola waste sites. Uh, it's got a lot of material. Fukushima has a has a reputational element to it, not just a decommissioning element to it. So the idea of trying to find beneficial reuse for the materials that will be coming from the decommissioning of those reactors is really, you know, is really important. And obviously embracing the concept of circular economy, bringing that in as policy is really one of the ways that you can, you can try to, you know, you, you can, you can create the opportunities for finding beneficial reuse for materials. And, and in the Japanese particular be one where I think this would be a, a great opportunity for them. So I just I bring that up as kind of an aside, but I'll I'll, I'll talk to the waste management folks about this. I, I like that idea. That was great, Greg. I mean I'm in a sticking sticking it with with you uh, as being the organizer, though. We'll have him chair. <laughs> yeah, we'll have him chair it. <laughs> I'll, I'll happy to support Paul. So, well, that could be so a I, concrete thing I have another. Go ahead, Charles. Excuse me. Oh, no, no, I just, Monica, you go ahead. I was just going to say, we, we got like one concrete recommendation coming out of this session. That's wonderful. Back to you, Monica. <laughs> uh, yeah, so so I, I have a, a question that I would like to ask uh, all three of you. And that is uh, an experience that we have in the United States, which is um, everybody's in favor of, you know, circular economy and reusing materials until it comes to building something with those materials and the cost associated with using recycled materials. 
uh, for other purposes. So the economic uh, uh, is perceived as an economic penalty versus using virgin materials. Uh, could you comment on your experiences on how can one address uh, the, those concerns? Uh, if, if I go first, it's uh, I'm, I'm familiar with the environment in in the U.S. Uh, you've got a lot of land, so so you're not constrained on on disposal, um, and I, and I think about most of your decommissioning sites as well. You you know you, we, we, I I live next door to a place called Sellafield. Yes. And um, and. and you know, some of the sites in, in the U.S. have similar things on them spread over 100 square miles, whereas that's all fitted into two square miles. So we're limited on space. Um, but I, th I think the big thing that you've got to do is have national policy and national strategy sat above this. Mm -hmm. And that has to be driving it. And then the, the, whole, the whole regulatory... Um, framework centered around it but ultimately to win the hearts and minds you've got to consider the full life cycle it's the same mm -hmm. as that example i gave earlier because we still come up against you know some people using a gross disproportion argument to say well i'm going to dispose of this low active metal because it's too expensive to recycle it right well have you considered the full benefit of recycling it have you considered the the upstream impacts associated with mining and creating that that virgin material and they hadn't and when you do apply that life cycle thinking mm -hmm. that and that's what sustainability is all about so the, a question was asked uh i think i think it was paul that said how 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 do we apply sustainability for those of you that are familiar um there's there's lots of concepts on sustainability, but two prominent are called weak and strong. And our optimization principle of you can have trade offs between environmental, societal, and economic. That's mm -hmm. that's weak sustainability, and the reason why it's weak is because you can quite quickly fall into this trap of I'm not going to do something beneficial for the environment because it costs too much. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. Let's see, uh, are near Patricia? No, could, maybe I, I could yeah. comment. But, but, uh, Patricia, go, go first. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, I think as long as we stay below clearance levels, uh, nobody is having a problem. Mm -hmm. Even though there's small amounts of of substances, the radionuclides in there. Uh, in a normal situation as well, if we have natural radioactivity in our walls, everybody has, this is no problem. Nobody cares about that. The problem starts when we get above our clearance levels. And clearance levels, we can change. <laughs> we changed um, and, and we reduced them. So we have more problems now. Um, these clearance levels, and I think, um, I don't know if, well, I do not have the solution for everything, but the specific clearance that we can use, I think if, if that's a more common uh, common known, more, more uh, information to the public, to the audience that, that we need to accept a little bit maybe, but it's, it's very complicated. And every time we are comparing apples and oranges with everything that we mm -hmm. do if it's environment and, and money or if it's uh, uh, future or, or now or if it's th there are many things to consider and all that it's it's complicated to compare which is which are the cost benefits which are the benefits which are the costs mm -hmm. and well there, there we need to discuss a little bit more to uh, to get through that and not get stuck with that because for now it's it's like we're stuck with the, the cost benefit situation since we do not know what benefits are and, and we do not know what the costs are and, and and how can we compare yeah thank you arnie uh, maybe i could come back to, to what craze and what life cycle analysis because 
learnings from, from our operations is that, that in the past, we, we every, all focus was to, to make the metal subject to clearance. So if it contains some copper or some aluminum or whatever, that didn't matter because at that time, we had foundries in Sweden which make low quality materials. So for them, only a low price matters. Those foundries are in China today. Uh, so mm -hmm. we need to meet the the, the demands from from the the steel industry industry or metal industry remaining. So we, we need to think a lot about this. We, we did avoid downcycling, etc., because it has to be a good material. Because otherwise, yeah. no one is is interested. So right. we need to to apply life cycle thinking also in in the nuclear operations when managing the, the material to make an attractive product and to have a good business and also when it comes to costs and, and revenues if, if i can just add to that Arne, we uh, we've just uh, undertaken quite a comprehensive life cycle analysis of our metals treatment and we actually concluded that if you're going to get it melted you need to get it melted in sweden and the reason why you need to get it melted in sweden is because their grid their electric supply is primarily off renewables so it's clean energy going mm -hmm. in the carbon detriment of running yeah. a smelter is a lot better to smell in in Sweden. <laughs> I yeah. see. Uh, uh, no, no, but but, but uh, that is one of our sell, sales argument. We are yeah. selling fossil free uh, metals to to, to right. the to the metal industry. So uh, and we need to take care of that opportunity to to make something good. Yeah. No. It it all matters, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, we got about uh, five more minutes. So I'm gonna uh, go back to Paul, uh, see if there are more questions and if not some are closing remarks. I actually think we only have two minutes, Monica. So oh, maybe what we can do is, is five. I thought it was oh, two or five. Oh. oh, all right, never mind. Well, okay, because you're gonna say seven minutes. <laughs> got seven minutes. Okay. Well, no, I just I think this has been a great conversation and you know, unfortunately, I, I come away with much many more questions uh, that I'd like to probe into, most, not least of which is really the, you know, how you gained acceptance for this process. It was not something which came overnight. It had to be evolved as a, as a whole series of steps and policies. Um, and that's really kind of where I'm, I'm interested in, because if we were to try to take the same thought process in the United States, it, you know, it would, it would take us this would be a difficult thing for us to move forward on. And I'm just kind of curious what, what you, what you saw were your, your, your paths forward. How did you make this, how did you make this go forward and embrace this whole concept or get, get the public to embrace it? If, if I can go first, yeah. I suspect if we didn't have that burning platform in 2005, where we were going to run mm -hmm. out of space, we would probably not be where we are today. We had that burning yeah. platform for change. And for us, um, uh, melting metals has been done for, for a long time. If it wasn't in Sweden, it was in Germany before. So that's nothing new. And for other ideas about circular economy, it's going slow. And there is, it, it took at least 10 years, last 10 years for discussion on, on concrete for one license to nearly be there. So it's, it's going slow. And it's uh, thanks to a couple of persons <laughs> who are just continuing on the battle of circular economy that we need to think that way, but we still are very far from solutions because the, the perception of the citizens is, is not that far. We, we can't. If I should follow what we have done in Sweden, which uh, we are really proud of, is that, that we have developed a guidance for takers of, of material which have passed clearance. And mm -hmm. there was a working group with the regulators, with, with the waste organizations, with the metal industry, with, with the nuclear power plants, with, with companies like, like my company. We were sitting down together and we have been working, uh, developed a guidance to put into different perspective into this, and we have make a handshake between regulators and, and supply generators of such materials and the takers of that. And it, 
it has been really great. So it's to be published in near term, but just that process has been very, very good. That would be great. I think, well, hopefully we'll, we'll get a copy of that in English. <laughs> Oh, uh, maybe, maybe. No, but, but I, I think other countries have also said that this is great. Uh, Yeah. so, so maybe there, there could be a translated version. I don't know. Uh, because it, it's it's uh, the regulator is responsible for the document. But, but I will put forward that message. I think just to add something that we've tried to do to cement this and further optimize is we have, we're in the process of producing now national optimization cases for different material types. What's the best thing to do with this? And it's considered the full life cycle. And we're hoping that it'll get to the position where the operators, the regulators have already said that that will be the default optimization case and, and, operators will need to justify why, why they would deviate from it. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm, like I said, I've got a lot more questions, but not a lot of time to go. So, um, all right, Monica, well, now we only have three minutes, so perhaps we ought to do a wrap up and thank everybody for their, uh, for the opportunity here. This has been a great, uh, I think Charles, we need to follow this up a little bit more and maybe think about having this next year, uh, further discussion. And, and what I'd like to see is if we could do this, but bring in some of our, our, uh, nuclear industry, uh, colleagues from both the decommissioning mm -hmm. side, as well as the reactor. or a vendor side, because some of the design concepts you're talking about really make a lot of sense as to how they would do this. So, so this is an opportunity for us to, this is a, the, I hope this is the first meeting of, a, of several that will follow on this, on this topic. Yeah, and uh, I'll let go of Paul. Uh, this has been very helpful, and I do want to personally thank all of you for participating. Uh, it's, it's a great start of a conversation, and um, I, I got it from uh, Ernie, uh, we do need to bring more players because it is a holistic solution uh, to get into a circular economy. So that, that will hopefully be our next, uh, our next uh, meeting. So thank you so much. And we appreciate you joining us today. Yeah. Thank, thank you again. You. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Look forward to meeting in person someday. All right. Well, that's an interesting session. Monica and Paul, thank you so much yeah. for, for guiding that discussion. That was fantastic. And we're right on time. And I'm looking, it looks like our next panelists are, are all connected. That's great. Thank you all for being here on time. Appreciate that. And um, so Charles Ferguson again, I will keep my marks very, very brief because we have Alison McFarlane who is going to be chairing and moderating this session. And um, and I think Allison, you may know all these panelists. I know maybe know at least at least a couple of them and work with them. So a uh, bit of a reunion here and uh, looking forward to this conversation. Over to you, Allison. Okay, great. Thank you, Charles. Yes, I'm looking forward to. So we're going to be talking about nuclear fusion and pr proliferation risks. Um, and uh, there, of course, many of you know, there's a lot of hype around fusion as a potential energy source sometime in the near future, etc. cetera. Uh, but I think we have to always examine challenges uh, to these kinds of energy resources, et cetera. And so one of these challenges is potentially proliferation uh, of nuclear weapons. And so we are gonna have a bit of a discussion about this today. And I'm gonna run things a little differently from the previous panel. So I'll introduce everybody very briefly and then immediately turn to questions. Um, and I'll go back and forth with the panel with uh, a number of questions. And then I will invite the um, committee members to ask questions uh, once we've had a bit of a, a chance to chat. So um, I just want to tell the panelists, the three of you, you know, when you're 
ready, you know, if you've got something to say, please, you know, re be ready to jump in. I really want to hear from all three of you uh, on, on all of these topics. So, so without further ado, let me introduce the panel. Uh, we have Alexander Glaser, who is uh, Associate Professor at the School of Public and International Affairs and in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Princeton University. We have uh, Sarah Pozzi, who is a uh, professor of nuclear engineering and radiological sciences and professor of physics, as well as the University of Diversity and Social Transformation Pre Professor at the University of Michigan. Uh, and we have Philip Sauter, who is a research fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law. So welcome to the three of you and thank you you so much for uh, spending this time with us. We really look forward to our discussion. And so um, I'm going to start us off with the, the first sort of broad question, which is, and I want to hear from each of you on this, and, and if you argue with each other, that's great too. Um, <laughs> that makes it more fun <laughs> and interesting. Um, so what do you all think are the potential proliferation risks and proliferation scenarios uh, from fusion that fusion poses? So Alex, I'm gonna start with you. Okay, well, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, thanks, we just got a note in the chat that uh, headphones would be better, but uh, I guess now it's too late. Um, well, first of all, let me uh, thank you for, for having us. Uh, it's a great honor and, and pleasure to be here. Uh, I will try and keep this really short um, and because I, I do think we'll have enough time uh, to go through all the questions. I want to make sure we'll have the time. So if you just ask about the potential proliferation risks associated uh, with fusion energy, and I'll just give you a list. I, I would um, put on that list, and there's nothing too surprising here, I suppose, uh, the production of um, fissile material in a declared fusion power plant. Um, so I assume we're not talking about fusion fission hybrids here. So um, my assumption is we're talking about a fusion only facility and the scenario where a proliferator would uh, introduce fertile material into uh, the machine in the blanket, let's say. So that's number one, covert production of fissile material in a declared plant. Uh, second um, item would be a tritium diversion uh, from the plant for military uh, or non-peaceful purposes. Uh, third uh, on the list would be fissile material production in a, let's say, smaller uh, clandestine or undeclared plant. Uh, so that's sort of connected to the uh, the first point. Uh, and then I would also add, even though um, I, I don't have a lot to say about uh, those um, aspects, uh, obviously sort of knowledge uh, in the case of inertial confinement fusion, uh, which is po uh, possibly relevant for um, weapon uh, design uh, purposes. And then maybe finally, uh, I added one more thing, which was um, uh, lithium enrichment. And, and sometimes lithium enrichment or lithium and tritium are bundled together uh, under light isotopes. Um, but uh, I just think it's worth sort of adding to that list. Uh, a fusion reactor would require most likely enriched lithium, lithium-6. Um, and um, and again, there are actually not too many sources today for this material, um, but presumably uh, there would have to be an industry uh, making enriched, enriched lithium, which also have a, a role in advanced weapons. So I'll leave it at that. I, these are my five bullets, but I really focus on number one, which is material production in a declared plan. Okay, great. Sarah, let me turn to you and same question. Yeah, thank you. So uh, three hypothetical risks and have already been covered by Alex. Um, the first one, the transfer of knowledge from fusion systems to uh, pr proliferate uh, vertically uh, to thermonuclear weapons. Um, the second is the proliferation of tritium, as was mentioned. And the third, uh, the, the use of the fusion neutrons to to breed, you know, the, the SNM, special nuclear material. 
uh, starting from source material like uranium-238 and generating plutonium, uranium-235, and so on. So um, the differences between a fission system and fusion system is that in, in a fusion system, you don't really have uh, nuclear materials uh, inherently in the system. So you would have to modify it significantly. Okay, great. And Philip, let's have you weigh in on this. Yeah, both Alex and Sarah already have given a comprehensive list of proliferation potential, so I have nothing to add there. Okay, well, so then let me turn to you for the next question, Philip, to start us off on how credible or risky is each of these scenarios, three or five of them, uh, depending on, on how you count. So if I imagine I am a state and I want to develop nuclear weapons, so I'm, I'm one of the non-nuclear weapon states, and then I have then I want to pursue a pathway towards nuclear weapons, then today, of course, I would focus on fission and follow a fission pathway. However, the question is, how will it be in the next 20, 30, 40 years when we actually have a nuclear fusion infrastructure? But from the simulations that I've seen, so I haven't conducted them myself, um, I refer mainly to, to simulations that were done actually by Alex Glaser and Rick Goldstein. Um, there is a significant amount of, so if we look at the first potential, the, the production of, of um, plutonium-239 or other fissile material, um, there is a significant, there's several significant quantities that could be produced by one fusion um, power plant per week. So compared to, for example, um, North Korea, which takes a lot longer to produce a significant uh, quantity in their fission-based reactors, there is a credible risk. However, it uh, depends a lot on how um, fusion actually will be deployed in the next couple of decades. decades. Yeah. And Sarah, maybe you can talk about that too, the credible risk, and and also weigh in in terms of the different kinds of fusion reactors we're talking about here. Uh, you know, in terms of the fusion system knowledge, uh, not particularly credible or relevant for vertical prol proliferation, because we know this because thermonuclear weapons were developed prior to these modern advances in fusion systems. So there was a pathway that was... We don't really need something like NIF or other, you know, big uh, fusion machines to, in order to develop thermonuclear capability in, in a nuclear weapon. Uh, the tritium mechanocy part that was mentioned is a new challenge, and additional controls may be uh, warranted because, you know, we're talking about kilogram quantities at scale uh, in a in a fusion plant. Um, so that, you know, compared to the current world inventory of tritium is a large amount. So uh, we would need to possibly, um, you know, have new ways to um, be able to track the tritium, you know, throughout the future plant, fusion plant. And in regards to neutron breeding, uh, breeding of SNM, that would require, I would imagine, substantial, I mean, we're talking about future here, right? So we're kind of Kind of looking ahead, and it would emit, it would require um, big modification to the system, to the blanket design. Um, so yeah, this is um, a summary kind of a, of the risks here. Okay, great, thanks. And Alex, why don't you weigh in on the credibility okay. of these different um, proliferation risks? Um. Yeah, maybe I can say one quick uh, thing before yeah. I start. Uh, I find it difficult. I mean, I think right now to sort of define, you know, how risky different scenarios are. I think it really depends on on sort of the architecture uh, of, you know, the, the the fuel cycle at that time. And, and just to give an example, in, in the 1980s, um, we thought that no country would ever use calutrons to enrich uh, uranium because it was such an obsolete and, and uh, outdated technology. And that's exactly what Iraq, Iraq did and sort of got away with it because no one was looking. Right? It, so um, it all depends on, uh, you know, what what the framework is in, in, in which you, you operate. So 
I, I hope that for, for fusion, there will be some uh, sort of monitoring system in place. And then all, many of these scenarios may just not be very risky. Uh, but if we sort of try to answer the question in a sort of in a vacuum or just based on the physics, then um, on the on the uh, the declared fusion facilities, I mean gigawatt scale fusion plants, I mean it's it's simply you know a matter of fact that you have lots of neutrons, right? Uh, and if you do the arithmetic, uh, you you will find. I mean in our paper we found you can in principle make you know twenty kilograms of of uh, fissile material in a, in a week, even if you just use a fraction of a percent of these neutrons, right? I mean, you still have to run your fusion plant, but you really need a very small fraction of these neutrons uh, to do uh, stuff uh, on, on a significant scale. So ballpark, so 20 kilos per week is our best, so our worst case. Uh, but even if you're conservative, you could imagine one kilogram of day, like one kilogram per day, which, which is which is, you know, a, a very large number. Um, and, and the reason is there are just not very many, uh, you know, rich uh, neutron, neutron rich environments around and, and, and fusion would offer such an environment. So in that sense, I think it's fair to say it's risky. Of course, you would have to modify the facility, et cetera. Uh, and it may be even even very simple to safeguard, uh, but in, if you don't do that, then you really have uh, a very interesting environment. So that's number one. On the tritium, um, how risky? Um, again, just to put things in perspective for a, a, a significant weapons program, you would be very happy to have, let's say 50 to 100 grams of tritium per year, let's say. I mean, that would be enough to sustain um, a significant stockpile of nuclear weapons. So 50 to 100 grams per year, because it's the case with a certain half-life. In a gigawatt scale fusion plant, you would consume about 400 grams of tritium per day. Uh, so instead of per year, now we have per day. So it's a completely different time scale. And of course, you would have to also produce <laughs> this, this tritium while you're consuming it. So the throughput of a gigawatt scale fusion plant uh, in terms of tritium is, is very large. I mean, on the order of several kilograms of inventory uh, at any given moment. Uh, tritium accountancy is really, really hard. Uh, everyone who deals with tritium, I think, will, <laughs> will confirm that. Um, and I think, you know, uh, so the security and the um, procedures that are in place uh, are very strong. They have to be strong, uh, very strong anyway. Uh, to ensure that nothing, you know, gets out. So um, I think containment and surveillance has to be in place um, anyway, and that might help us uh, make sure that tritium is not diverted. I guess we'll get to that in uh, later on in the conversation. Uh, the last point I would maybe make on the covert facilities, uh, the smaller um, fusion reactors. Uh, we had an assessment in our 2012 paper where we said, well, it's not really plausible. I mean, these machines are uh, very big. Uh, they need a lot of grid power. Uh, they're very visible. We should be able to find them. And they wouldn't be making a lot of uh, uh, fissile material anyway, in the best case. But there has been a lot of new interest in fusion energy. As you may know, there's uh, plenty of startups uh, that have new ideas, uh, sort of fundamentally new designs. I think um, they raised more than $7 billion uh, uh, in, in recent years. Uh, and uh, some claim to produce electricity uh, by the end of this decade. I think the, um, the one is collaborating with Microsoft. Um, so I think it's sort of an interesting uh, space we are in. Uh, I understand the industry is very... Uh, <laughs> Uh, would rather not have any involvement of the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, etc. But I think it's an important point in time to sort of recognize that there have been tremendous, uh, there's been tremendous progress in that in that area. And now maybe I'll stop there. And uh, great, no, that's that's really up. helpful, Sarah. Can I ask? Are there any particular of these new designs that you're particularly concerned about in terms of proliferation? Um, I don't link it specifically to any new design, but just the idea that the fusion systems are just inherently different from the current fission systems in that they don't really use the special nuclear materials, so they don't really have a traditional fuel cycle. 
including uranium and plutonium. And so, you know, I 100% agree with Alex that we have a lot of neutrons. Yes, it, they promise to have, you know, very, very bright sources of neutrons. But at the same time, we need to bring in this material into facility that inherently does not have it. So there's a fundamental change in the facility if we're going to try to use it to breed plutonium. And the point is we have ways to breed plutonium now, today, right? So a would-be proliferator would be definitely, if I'm a nefarious actor, right, would be better off, you know, using a, a fission system that inherently has these materials. Right. Okay. So then now let's turn to... I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Philip. Philip. Sorry. Um, so I think in that regard, there are also other aspects. So... Right now, the fusion industry is driven by startups, and a startup, of course, don't have any interest in, in producing any nuclear weapons material. And in addition, the most advanced startups are located in the U.S., which is a nuclear weapon state anyway, so there's not this big um, interest by the international community right now. Okay, yeah, excellent points, thanks. So, uh, Philip, um, let me start off with you in terms of talking about how to reduce some of these risks, um, you know, what kind of safeguards we might be able to add to these facilities. Yeah, so I think there are two important points. On the one hand, there's safeguards, but on the other hand, it's also transparency. Um, for example, two big players in the fusion field right now, um, they're also collaborating with universities or research facilities, for example, in the US, the um, Commonwealth Fusion Systems, which works closely with MIT, or in Germany, Proxima Fusion, which works with the um, IPP closely. And they publish a lot of their ideas and concepts in scientific journals. And we as scientists know the best um, the, that peers could, can be the, the strictest observers. So um, as long as there's transparency within these designs, I think this is an uh, important factor because as, as we've seen, to um, um, use a nuclear power plant to breed, a uh, fusion power plant to, to breed um, for some material um, requires a lot of changes to a standard um, um, fusion power plant. Then, of course, safeguards are an important factor. If we refer back to the plutonium breeding scenario, I think this is the easiest approach where safeguards can apply because if you detect um, any uh, that radiation from uranium, plutonium, plutonium whatsoever, within a fusion facility, you know there's something going wrong. To some extent, there can be um, um, traces of uranium within a beryllium breeding blanket, but apart from that, you don't expect any um, large amounts of uranium or plutonium within a fusion facility. So if you detect any kind of, of traces of, of uh, decays from these materials, um, this is a very straightforward approach to safeguards. On the other hand, it's it's tritium, of course. Um, there the question is on how to develop a tritium accountancy system. Um, as already has been mentioned by Alex Glaser, tritium accountancy is extremely difficult. However, the UK AEA, so the UK Atomic Energy Agency, recently has started a tritium project where they try to focus on, on different aspects of tritium because tritium accountancy, containment of tritium is also a safety aspect. And safety is what is right now at the focus of fusion regulation. So these two points may go hand in hand. Which is more difficult is like the third broader um, issue of inertial confinement fusion on how to limit the, the, the gain of knowledge from these facilities. And finding an answer there is kind of tricky, especially as we're still in the experimental or in the development phase. Once there is one setup, how the lasers are set up, um, how big targets are, how many grams of deuterium and tritium they contain, of course, then the limit, uh, the, the gain of knowledge will be limited because you cannot vary, there's not much variety in your parameters. But getting there might still entail some um, knowledge gains, which are difficult to safeguard. Okay, great. Sarah, can I turn to you to talk about? potential safeguards or or maybe other methods to try to you know control the potential for proliferation 
Yeah, I think the important to to have this conversation now as the fusion systems are being developed as opposed to trying to figure it out afterwards. So it's important to continue this conversation. And also there is existing measures around the know-how and the technology development that include things like classification and export controls and, and, and these regimes that could be applied. Um, also uh, the, uh, when we look at the MPT and the additional protocol, um, it allows for complementary access to facilities where the IEA could allow access to other facilities that are non-nuclear sites like accelerators. And um, this could be also a mechanism uh, used to ensure that the plant is not used in nefarious ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Alex, do you want to weigh in on this question of safeguards? I think you've probably done. Um, Thank sure. you. Sure. I mean, um, so I mean, I'm still sort of with the previous or the, the third question, how can the risks uh, be, be reduced real quick? I mean, I agree with everything that uh, Sarah and, and Philip have said. I would maybe, uh, uh, um, well, I don't know, put it differently, uh, but there's sort of intrinsic and then there are uh, extrinsic uh, dimensions. Uh, by intrinsic, I mean really sort of the design of uh, the technology. Um, I think, you know, maybe proliferation resistant uh, sort of a word we used in the, uh, the 70s and 80s. But so the idea is there may be certain designs that um, that may be more proliferation resistant than others, uh, just as an example. And we don't I don't think we know the answers yet, which I think why this is such an interesting time to uh, to uh, reflect uh, on these on these um, on this topic, for example, um, the blanket could be a, a liquid blanket or a solid blanket, and they may have very different uh, features with regard to how they could possibly be used for fissile material production. I don't think we really understand, you know, what the pros and cons for for different types of design choices are. Uh, a plant could be designed in a very flexible way or uh, in a very sort of uh, rigid way and um, and having valves and uh, and and you know pipes in, in design a or design B may make a big difference in terms of how uh, these facilities could be used in a way other than they were actually designed for in the first place. And then finally sort of safeguards by design. I mean that's what I try to, uh, emphasize when we had a meeting about a year ago here in Princeton with some of these startup companies when we, I tried to argue if if you actually proactively think about how someone else someone independent um, an independent uh, inspector come in and wants to uh, reassure themselves that uh, this facility is not producing fissile material what would you do or where would you put a port or an instrument uh, so that it would be relatively easy to just confirm it and rather than having it done, you know, once the facility is done and things are you know, sort of too late. So that's all on the intrinsic side. And I think now is a good time to really think this through. Uh, on the extrinsic side, uh, again, this is really safeguards, obviously, uh, and this has been uh, mentioned, uh, you know, how to actually come up with an approach that would um, meet certain verification objectives. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm sure we're going to talk more about uh, the challenge of actually getting there. Um, so the uh, the one other thing I would mention, maybe mentioned or add to the list, uh, would be sort of regional considerations. Um, so the idea of, for example, operating fusion plants in as part of a multilateral uh, framework. I mean, it would make me much less nervous if you know uh, several countries. Uh, cooperate and, and run and operate a, a facility uh, jointly. Uh, so I would also throw this into um, the mix of extrinsic factors that would reduce the risk of um, uh, proliferation risks associated with fusion energy. And then, okay, I hand it back over to you, but the question how to get there uh, is is a, a complex one. Uh, you know, what types of safeguards are actually available? And if we read, if we read the book, if we go by the book, um, then it's not obvious how say, uh, fusion power plants would automatically be uh, safeguarded under, let's say, the NPT. Right. But that's why we're having this conversation, I guess. Right, right. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's uh, it, this is this is fascinating to me anyway. Um, 
Maybe, um, Sarah, you could say something about the costs of safeguards. Um, right, because you know, I know mm -hmm. Go ahead. This is a big, I know the fission side of things much better than the fusion side of things, but on the fission side of things, there's always a lot of pushback against cost, um, especially for the the uh, nuclear bros as they were developing these technologies. Um, you know, they want to make them as cheap as possible. To, so the thought of adding additional costs through safeguards is not not a pleasant pleasant one. So, yes, because you know these fusion energy systems, they promise to provide you know this great source of energy that we so need uh, right now, and we certainly don't want to weigh in with further costs if right. not absolutely necessary. So, um, so it's it's a kind of a challenging time right now. But I think that uh, when we consider safeguards, it's really about the nuclear special nuclear material and the nuclear material that we want to account for. So the idea is that we don't have that in a fusion system. In principle, we don't have we should not have any uh, uranium or plutonium present in the system. So there could be some safeguards measures that are relatively inexpensive that could be applied. And these could be things like the swipes, right? So if you perform swipes and you find that in this plant, you start to find you know, uranium and plutonium where they shouldn't be, then that would raise a big red flag and this would not be very expensive, hopefully. And this has to do with complementary access. And we talked about earlier, you know, through the IEA complementary access to facilities that um, in principle could be very helpful to see if somebody is trying to breed plutonium using the fusion plant, right? Another thing would be to use things like portal monitors, for example. So we know about portal monitors. These um, could intercept any large amounts of high Z, these high Z special nuclear materials uh, that could in principle be brought in if somebody were to misuse the fusion facility to try to to make um, to make plutonium again, you have to you'd have to bring bring in the source material, uh, the U two thirty eight, and then you would have to somehow bring out the plutonium. So certainly not a simple task, right? But we're just we're, we're thinking about future here. Yeah, no, that those examples are really really helpful. What about tritium, Sarah? What would you do? Yeah, on tritium, tritium, we mentioned before about tritium, and that is really a challenge because it really would have to be almost um, some new methods would have to be developed to, to perform this tritium accountancy, right? So is a tritium accountancy and similar to what we know about um, the traditional fuel cycle accountancy. So um, there's material that you could imagine is uh, stuck, you know, in the facility. So you, it's what we call the material autocatted for mm -hmm. or muff, right? That material. So you'd have to account, you know, for all of that material and be able to see, you know, that uh, hopefully no material is being diverted from the facility. But here again, you know, it's it would have to require new evaluation of the risk and, you um, ways to account for the tritium cycle. And Philip, let me turn to you and ask you to talk a little bit more, uh, more about um, uh, safeguards and maybe some of the challenges you see in trying to apply safeguards to fusion. Maybe if I can first um, add on the cost side. Yes, please. That would be great. Great. There, there's another cost, which is the PR cost, I would call it, um, because the fusion industry is very keen on separating themselves from the fission side. So we, today we talk about nuclear fusion, but they themselves only talk about fusion because they want to be um, kept apart from the nuclear stigma and mm -hmm. simply applying 
all the IAEA safeguards developed for um, nuclear power plants might be um, yeah, difficult um, for them trying to be seen as a totally different technology than, than fission technology. Um, Excellent then to, point. Excellent point. <laughs> um, then to come back on your question on the application of safeguards. So the biggest thing is that today the safeguards and um, the safeguards regime that exists um, mainly does not apply to fusion. So the safeguards regime is based on Article 3 on the NPT, which um, mandates um, safeguards on source and special fissionable material. Um, so uranium, plutonium, thorium. Um, these um, safeguards obligations are further specified in comprehensive safeguards agreement, which are concluded between the IAEA and non-nuclear weapon states. And these agreements also do not apply on fusion as they focus themselves on sources of special fissionable material and on nuclear facilities, which are defined as reactors, enrichment facilities, and all the facilities from um, within a fission fuel cycle. As Sarah already mentioned, there's only one aspect which applies, which is within the additional protocol, which applies to around 120 non-nuclear weapon states um, out of 100 and what is it, 80 something. Mm -hmm. um, and there's the complementary access and environmental sampling, which um, would at least tackle the question of, um, of breeding um, plutonium and other for some material within fusion. So then if one decides to include broader safeguard approaches to fusion facilities, then the entire regime would have to be adapted. And this is an, an extremely difficult task. I mean, um, not to speak about today's geopolitical, uh, geopolitical environment, also within the NPT, every five years, there's a conference, a review conference, where all the state parties discuss about the recent progress of the treaty. And the last, I think, two or three review conferences, the, the state parties couldn't even agree on a non-binding outcome document. And then thinking about all those states coming together and, um, and, and working on new safeguards is extremely difficult, especially, as I said, there's only 120 state parties to the additional protocol. So there are around 60 states which say, I don't, don't want to be part of the additional protocol. Some of them say, why should I submit myself to, um, to more stringent safeguards while nuclear weapon states are not progressing towards nuclear disarmament? So there's also maybe some kind of connection. The longer nuclear weapon states refuse to reduce the nuclear arsenals or actually work towards nuclear disarmament, that other states might refuse to increase um, the international oversight on their fusion technology, especially given um, the costs that Sarah mentioned, um, that there's some kind of imbalance within the international system, making it um, extremely difficult. Right, thank you uh, for that very depressing <laughs> <laughs> bit of information. Um, Alex, let me turn to you and say, you know, it sounds, I wanna hear more about this meeting, I don't know if I can, uh, about, that you had with some of the uh, fusion designers. And, and I'm wondering what kind of reception you got there to the discussion of safeguards. I can imagine because having met with some of the, um, you know, uh, small modular reactors and advanced reactor companies, a lot of them hadn't, you know, this was a few years ago, but a lot of them hadn't really given much or any thought to safeguards and the idea of safeguards by design you know, it sounded good to us, but it just was sort of above their pay grade, really. So I want to hear more about that and, and what you think about some of the, the challenges are here to getting some kind of control regime in place. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. Where do I start? Um, yeah. no, I completely, <laughs> I com I completely uh, agree. I mean, uh, and I sort of understand where they're coming from. I mean, they raised a, a bunch of money uh, uh, from, you know, venture capital. And and part of the, the narrative was, and I think rightly so, uh, that the proliferation risks of this technology uh, is much, you know, if done right, is much less than some, some other fission-based technologies. And I think so the funders would be surprised now if they came back and said, well, we actually, we, we do want to have safeguards. It, it sounds very uh, differently. But what the argument I try to make is, as I already mentioned, it could be very simple to, to make sure um, 
uh, to meet the verification objectives. I mean, this, this could be unattended monitoring, this could be a, a few detectors here and there, and you're done, but we have to sort of think about this now. Uh, what one of them said at the beginning of the meeting uh, on stage, and this may be on video, I guess, uh, they said uh, the NPT does not apply to fusion energy, which is absolutely, uh, you know, it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. And, and, and yet uh, I, I was surprised to hear this. Uh, it's true. I mean, the NPT is about peaceful use of nuclear energy, uh, and it's very uh, it's very high level language, which is sort of typical for for a treaty. It's true, of course, as Philip and and Sarah have pointed out, that the the safeguards agreement, the gold standard uh, comprehensive safe, safeguards agreement, uh, one hundred fifty three, based on one hundred fifty three, uh, focuses on on special fissionable material, where a, a fusion reactor that doesn't have any uranium on site would not be. Uh, would not have to be declared. Um, so there is this question, how do we phase in uh, if that's what we are trying to accomplish, safeguards? And there's sort of different way. And I think one important question is, do we want to have it mandatory from the outset or voluntary? And uh, we can have a long discussion about that. I actually have no problem uh, with the idea of having it sort of voluntary in the beginning and that's very easy to do uh, and in fact it's in the statute of of the IEA the uh, IEA uh, the agency is authorized to apply safeguards at the request of a state to any of that state's activities in the field of atomic energy so if a state approaches the IEA and says look we have a fusion device here that we would like to have under safeguards uh, there would be no question about the authority of the agency to go there. Uh, the same is true for the additional protocol, uh, which has been mentioned. Uh, complementary access is a little tricky because the agency sort of has to have a reason to go to a certain facilities, a facility to have to, there have to be questions. Uh, but there's actually also Article 8 in the, in the additional protocol, uh, which is very similar to what I just read, uh, which essentially says, a state can request the agency to conduct verification activities at a particular location. So um, this could, in principle, be um, you know formalized on sort of a voluntary uh, basis. Um, there, so the the comprehensive safeguards agreements. Again, I agree, and this is maybe too good, weedy, and perhaps we can talk about this uh, at the end if we have uh, still some time. Even that might be possible. Uh, um, uh, at some level, there is at least one precedent, and that goes back to the 1990s when uh, neptunium and americium was considered as a special fission of the material. And the, the director general went to the board of governors and essentially sort of proposed three options, how to uh, think about adding neptunium and uh, americium. And they developed a procedure, uh, sort of a... Um, uh, away in the middle, uh, how the agency is currently sort of dealing with this uh, this question. And in principle, you could, <laughs> it wouldn't be possible at the outset, but you could in principle consider or think about how, a similar process where the Board of Governors would, uh, would consider fusion reactors and states could volunteer to help the agency develop, you know, safeguards approaches and then this could be revisited later on, uh, and then there would have to be a decision whether or not uh, 153 would be amended of some sort, which would be very difficult, obviously. Right. Okay. Great. That's excellent. So I'm, I'm going to stop hogging all the questions now. Um, I could go on. I think this is a fascinating discussion, but let me, let me open the floor or up to my colleagues on the Nuclear and Radiation Studies Board for questions and um, and I think you're, unless Charles tells me you're gonna have to raise your electronic hand for me to see this. Um, okay, uh, Charles, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm modeling. Yeah, this is, wow, thank you. This has been a fantastic uh, conversation, everyone. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, Alex at the beginning, you know, identified the right list of the scenarios and uh, you know, and I've read his earlier paper with uh, Rob Goldstone, and and I, I understand their arguments that the covert facility is probably you know not too risky or not too great of concern. But and I also understand what what Sarah's saying about 
you know, special nuclear material would not typically be in a fusion plant. However, uh, without, you know, naming, you know, particular source, I, I you know, I th there is, uh, there have been some uh, talk in for a long time about developing some kind of hybrid hybrid system where you have fusion fission combined and so um you know it's so it's not far fetched uh, you know i i i know that there have been you know people who have been thinking about that so uh, i just want to put that out there is you know that's that could be something that could allow for uh a, a development of a model uh a safeguard system that could have an anchor to uh, what's in the comprehensive safeguards agreement for typical fusion fission reactors, but also as a way of then thinking about extending it to this more hybrid fission fusion type system. Yeah, Charles. So definitely in the case of a hybrid system that has a fission component, then definitely we are back into the safeguards regime with uh, the nuclear material and the accountancy and all of that. So yes, uh, all of my comments were related to a fusion only system, which I think, you know, is what we are fundamentally talking about here. But yeah, absolutely. In the case of a mixed system, then yes, safeguards, MPT, all of that comes into play. Let me see if um, Alex or Philip wants to comment on Charles's question. Philip, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, maybe to add on that right now, there are, I think around 50 startup companies worldwide working on fusion power plants, and none of them are following any hybrid approach. So the hybrid system is a theoretical um, concept, but I don't see it happening within the next 50 years or so. I think the first step is to make pure fusion happen, and maybe then in the future, but I don't see it within the next half decade or so. Right. Yeah, Alex, did you want to... Thanks. Did you want to add yeah. anything? No, I mean, I agree. I mean, I remember a talk uh, Ed Moses gave here at Princeton a long time ago, and it was fusion fission hybrids, a marriage made in heaven or so. Uh, but I sort of didn't, <laughs> I didn't find that title very compelling. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I mean, in in many ways, and I, agree it would be such a, a you know philip mentioned the pr angle it would be such an odd thing to do you 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 bring the fission in and you just try to make the argument that you want to pursue a different route uh, by um so i that's a good thing that uh, i think for now we don't see fission fusion hybrids by the way we talked a little we didn't really talk about nif or or uh, inertial confinement fusion and 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 again, I have a feeling it's now accepted that uh, NIF and and other facilities in in France and elsewhere are really just military facilities, uh, and, and they're mostly uh, designed to support the weapons programs. And um, fortunately, I would say we haven't really seen, uh, you know, none of the startups would go down that road. I mean, if you're really interested in energy, then um, the the fusion. Um, uh, the plasma-based systems are the, sort of the way to go. So the hope is, you know, maybe some of these issues just won't come up because no one will pursue them. Yeah, great. Let me turn it over to Paul Dickman. So, hey, Allison, thanks for putting this together because uh, this has been kind of bugging me too. Uh, uh, in fact, I had some colleagues attend the meeting that uh, was uh, held at Princeton and they came away from that uh, somewhat stunned by the reaction on the industry's part. Uh, and uh, and then a few months later, I was actually at a meeting with the White House when they had this came up again. The question that I really have is, well, I can appreciate why the, the industry associations are trying to distance themselves from the idea of, of uh, nuclear weapons the development. Why wouldn't they want to embrace the concept of being in conformance with with uh, with with international norms such as the MPT? I, I, you know, I don't understand that logic. Is it is it just because the association concept? Because I would think if I was an investor, I want to make sure that my technology is in conformance with all these safeguard arrangements and everything else. So I, I just don't understand that that. I mean, maybe uh, I don't know. It, it was puzzling to me because I certainly scratched my head after that White House meeting. Right. 
Uh, let me let all of you respond to, to Paul and add anything on. Um, I think we should invite the industry participants at the next panel. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. I know it's it's a, it's a good idea. Um, yeah. Sarah, do you want to add anything are, to that? Uh... Sorry. No, I'm I'm okay. Okay, Alex, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I mean, uh, again, I fully agree with Paul just said. Uh, it's not that they, I think they're nervous. Uh, they're not taking a proactive approach right now, by and large. Uh, but it's also true that if you read the fine print in the NPT and the safeguards agreement, if there is no nuclear material on site, then uh, it would not fall under safeguards. So, um, and right now, I think we're having that debate uh, whether or not it's wise uh, to sort of stick to um, the uh, the current law or to to see how we can actually uh, be smart about this and open minded. And in the end, I honestly believe it could be relatively simple to make sure that a fusion power plant is not making fissile material. It could be almost trivial uh, to be quite blunt. I mean, for example, if you do want to breed fissile material in a fusion plant, when you actually run the simulations, uh, at least on the order of 10% of your energy will eventually come from fission because you inevitably also fission some of the fertile material or the, uh, you know, whatever you're breeding. So, the the, new, the 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 energy balance would uh, would shift, uh, you know, compared to the the clean facility. So if you just have two or three instruments that are sort of keeping track of uh, the energy coming from the plasma and the energy actually being produced in the plant, if these numbers sort of shift or change, you would know that something is going on. And uh, you know, with machine learning and you know all kinds of smart algorithms, you would see that probably within seconds. And just sort of making that data available or thinking about how to come up with a, a smart metric that would simply show uh, is this pure fusion or is something else going on could be trivia. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd rather have this discussion now and build it into the de design from the outset and, and we're done. Um, yeah. So that's sort of my take on this. Yeah. Excellent point. Any other questions from the committee, otherwise I'm going to jump right back in. Um, and and uh, go ahead, Charles. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, Alex, I think, is coming back to a point that Philip raised earlier about transparency was one of the key concepts. And um, and also thinking off of what Paul was saying, like, why is industry so resistant? I mean, if they want to put forward, you know, a, a great, you know, um, not just a story, but you know the system is um, going to be uh, really above board and in line with international principles of how to treat nuclear technologies. Uh, so, is are there efforts, and maybe this gets into some of the uh, discussions that Alex had at, at Princeton with this group, and you know maybe we could, he can describe kind of what happens and you know what what took place under Chatham House rules, right? Is that is there efforts to put forward? A um, you know a, a principles a best practice for this industry, and it maybe is not just about uh, the proliferation concerns, but also things dealing with waste management and safety and and those across the board principles. And I'm kind of even tying this into the first panel we had on circularity, you know, in terms of applying principles of sustainability to this uh, new industry. I mean, I can say two or three quick things, but I don't want oh. to dominate here the conversation. Go ahead. Taste, say two or three quick sentences. And okay, then two or three, three quick things. I mean, it is, uh, uh, I think, um, Philip mentioned this. Uh, there are, you know, 50 or so startups out there, and uh, they compete against each other, right? And I think there's sort of a first mover advantage. They try to be first to market. And uh, and this is also why there is relatively little transparency right now, because uh, they consider this IP. Some of these startups haven't published anything, <laughs> yeah. including, I think, Helion, which promises to go live in 2028, et cetera. So I think there's a little bit of that happening right now. Uh, I think at some point, but with regard to the safeguards, it may be a bit of bluffing here too, where they just say, let's see, maybe we can get away with it. Uh, I wouldn't be <laughs> surprised 
if they eventually say, okay, let's have a conversation. Um, but, you know, we have to have the arguments. Um, and then maybe third, uh, something that is encouraging uh, uh, to be, you know, full disclosure, I, I met with uh, Grossi yesterday, he was at Princeton, we had a fireside chat for an hour or so. We had a little bit of conversation about fusion, but it's in his statements. Uh, where he said uh, you know, he just established a World Fusion Energy Group, WFEG. Um, they will meet in uh, Rome, I think, in November for the first time. And if you look at what they want to discuss, uh, the list includes actually um, they want to encourage discussions on establishing effective fusion regulations. <laughs> so we don't know what exactly that uh, means, uh, but it you know it's a word regulation. It may just be. Uh, you know, what the welders, what qualifications the welders have to have or so. Uh, but I think he will, might be open-minded uh, and he wants to bring together NGOs and uh, civil society and the industry and uh, the labs uh, to sort of participate in that uh, working group. So there's some hope that this conversation might actually go forward. But I do think we really need, I mean, input from, uh, you know, the academy or, you know, the um, whoever is actually doing uh, work in this area would be very important at this time. Sarah, do you want to weigh in on Charles's question? Yeah, I think that the um, companies now are really focusing on the challenges in the technology. And those are huge, right? Those challenges that need to be overcome in order to get energy to the grid in such a short amount of time. Yeah, so I think it's really important to have these conversations now, you know, before um, it, it gets to the point where we have a design plant um, and using some of the techniques that we already have in place, like export controls could be a really good way to help curb some of these challenges and make sure that the machine is really used for what it's intended to and not for any other any other uh, malignant use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Philip? Yeah, maybe to add on something that Alex just said about the regulation side. So all of the fusion startups are organized in the Fusion Industry Association, the FIA, and they're working intensively on, um, on, on pushing for fusion regulation worldwide. So on the international level, but also on um, different national levels. Right now, their main focus is on the safety side. So what will be the safety regulations? Will it be will a fusion power plant will be regulated domestically like a fission power plant, or is there is a specific regime maybe based on an accelerator? And the safeguards dimension for the non-proliferation side is also discussed, but mostly more on the sideline. Also, the IEA Department of Safeguards has recently started looking at it, but there's a lot um, of progress going on right now. However, as um, Sarah said, it's also important to have the discussions right now, because what startups say, even though it still needs 10 years or even more for their power plants to be on the grid, they're creating the designs right now. Mm -hmm. um, so as if we say, um, if we follow the concept, Alex said, like safeguards by design, as the designs are made right now, it's also important to consider safeguards by the zero, that's the safeguards in total um, right now as well. Right. So we have only a few seconds or minutes left. So just let me, before I, I do a little bit of a wrap up and thank you, you know, right now the issue of waste has finally been brought up and I'm interested in whether any of you think there are important aspects to radioactive wastes from fusion that either impact safety or safeguards. Sarah, do you wanna jump in on that one? Well, it goes back to this idea of treaty of accountancy and um, the challenges that we have there and understanding the full, full cycle of the tritium cycle in a fusion plant. And I think that's an important side of things. Also, the depiction of fusion plant as being 100% clean and, you know, 100% great, that's also a little bit misleading, right? Because we know that we have a highly radioactive situation going on. And so 
think about, you know, all of the activation of materials and so on. So that's something that, again, going back to transparency would be important to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Philip, did you want to add anything there? Of course, the waste will be something to discuss about, but as we've got a lot of experience handling um, waste from nuclear power plants, I think the few, dealing with the fusion waste won't be a problem at all, given that the amounts are lower, the, the level of radioactivity is different. Um, also, given the fact that most of the radioactivity is gone after 100 years, um, I think the the waste component isn't that big of an issue with fusion. Uh, Alex? Yeah, well, uh, I hope you're right, uh, Philip, but um, I mean, I'm not an expert in, in terms of waste volumes, uh, et cetera. I do think in terms of volume, uh, fusion could actually be worse than a fission, if I understand correctly, but it's um, it's not high-level waste. It's mo mostly uh, low-level waste, um, you know, which makes a big, uh, obviously a big difference. But, but it also, in terms of proliferation, which is really the topic I was sort of... Uh, focused on uh, today, I mean, in terms of extracting nuclear material from, uh, let's say, uh, the, the blanket material, it, it's actually much less radioactive. It's not, not high-level waste. So in terms of reprocessing um, and extracting plutonium or uranium-233, um, this would actually make it much uh, less uh, cumbersome than what you would have to do uh, when you want to reprocess, uh, you know, spent fuel from from a production reactor. I mean, that's sort of a very different take here. Uh, but yes, I mean, um, I think we should keep the waste uh, in mind uh, when we uh, when we design and, 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 and start these facilities right now. Uh, clearly, it's not something we did when we uh, launched, uh, you know, fission reactors and, and, <laughs> and now we're sort of dealing with uh, the challenges. Yeah. Yeah, and I will point out that there are many countries out there that have not yet even solved the low-level radioactive waste problem. Um, so there aren't facilities for low-level radioactive waste, let alone high-level radioactive waste or intermediate-level radioactive waste. So um, it's a problem that still needs resolution, uh, and you know it is it is an issue for fusion. Um, okay, off my soapbox now. Um, so I think this was a fantastic discussion. And I really appreciate all three of you contributing to the discussion. Philip, special thank you for you because I know it's really late <laughs> for you, unless you happen to be in North America now, which I don't imagine that you are. I'm in Germany. It's 9 p.m. Yeah, okay. So you can finally, you know, you finally earned your glass of wine and can go to bed. <laughs> um but really, thank thank you all three. You've given us on the board a lot to think about. I think there are lots of really important issues here that we should be talking about and and uh, and doing something on. And um, we will take this back and and chat about it. Um, so over to you, Charles, for any final words. Well, Allison, thank you so much. You did a fantastic job uh, chairing this session. And uh, Alex, uh, uh, Philip, and Sarah, th thank you all so much as well. And it's, uh, you know, I've had some interactions over the years with Alex and Sarah and, and in different contexts. And it's great to also meet uh, Philip virtually. Hopefully, we'll, we can meet in person sometime, not too in the distant future. So, um, yeah, totally agree with everything Allison said. Uh, uh, later, uh, well, tomorrow, actually, with the board and staff, we'll have some discussion about. You know, the implications of what you all said and uh, where we go from here. So, and, you know, may, maybe we will follow this up with uh, an industry uh, type of panel in a future meeting. So thank you all again. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Patience. Oh, okay. Uh, so we've earned a break. We've been going at it for a couple of hours, uh, two very different topics. And we have one final uh, session coming up in about uh, 11 minutes. So quarter after 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern time U.S. And I see that some of our panelists in the next panel have already connected, which is fantastic. And um, we'll look forward to uh, having conversation with you coming up in about 10 minutes. And so... Um, Look, we'll see you then. Bye.
All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. And maybe I've asked my colleagues in the background, please keep the voice down. <laughs> um, so thank you, Larry. I see you're, you're visible. So uh, uh, Larry Dower, one of our board members, at, well, he's at Memorial Sloan Kettering, will be um, chairing, moderating this panel discussion. And uh, I could probably do very brief introductions of the panelists. Uh, gentlemen, could you please uh, lower your voices in the background? Starting? Yeah, we're starting. Okay. Yeah, we're recording. Yeah, please. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to turn it over to Larry. He'll be the the Master Ceremonies Chair Moderator for this session. We have a bit more time than the two previous sessions because we have four panelists, not three. And this is a very complex uh, subject area. Uh, you know, Larry and Daniel Moreau and I developed a set of about 10 questions that we have we're going to go through with this panel. So I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Larry because uh, he's he's the he's the guy of the hour right now. Thanks, Larry. Great. Thanks very much, Charles. And to our panelists, esteemed panelists, it's an honor to facilitate the discussion today. Uh, the NRSB is especially interested in discussing this important topic, uh, alpha theranostic development, since theranostics and particularly targeted alpha therapies, uh, re they represent an exciting ongoing radiopharmaceutical development arena uh, with, I guess you could say, much potential for making precision medicine possible. Uh, for patients. Um, and so today we are so pleased to have Rebecca Evergel, Associate Professor, Department of Nuclear Engineering and Chemistry at the College of Engineering, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and she is a senior faculty scientist and director at the Glenn T. Seaborg Center at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. So welcome very much, uh, Rebecca. Uh, Dr. Lisa Baudet is attending and member of and director of the radio pharmaceutical therapy section of the molecular imaging and therapy service in the Department of Radiology. She's also an early drug development specialist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, uh, an international uh, uh, expert in this field. So thank you very much for joining with us today. Uh, Dr. Tara Mostrin uh, is assistant professor, nuclear engineering program and civil and environmental engineering at the University of Utah. Uh, she's gonna help us understand how, literally how these fit together. And uh, Dr. George Skuros, uh, professor of radiology and radiological science, department of radiation oncology and department of oncology. He's also the director uh, of the radiological physics division for the Johns Hopkins Kimmel Cancer Center. So uh, again, uh, it's an honor, and I know the, uh, myself and the rest of the NRSB are really thrilled to have the opportunity to spend this amount of time talking about a very exciting uh, area of development. So I'd like to start with George. Uh, if you could explain for us a little bit about what alpha theranostics are, or theranostics in general, uh, including alpha theranostics, and how diagnostics and therapeutics are combined. Larry, thanks so much. Let me start by saying this is really, if you think of swords, swords into plowshares, this is really the topic of, of these uh, uh, presentations. Uh, so, so to answer your question, I see I have about five minutes, but I, so I put these slides together when I saw uh, what we were going to discuss. So the basic, uh, thing we're talking about here is radiopharmaceutical therapy, cancer therapy, where you have a, a targeting molecule, this is an antibody, and you link it to a chelate, and others on this panel can talk about this stuff in a lot more detail. And then with this structure, you can either put a, a beta particle emitting radionuclide uh, or an alpha particle emitting radionuclide. And if we go down here, you can see that uh, for uh, for example, the PCM177 can emit both uh, uh, beta particles and photons. So the, the fundamental advance here is first you're delivering uh, alpha particle emitters to cancer cells, which lead to massive double strand breaks, very difficult to repair in terms of standard uh, repair mechanisms. And resistance is pretty much uh, uh, unlike 
standard resistance mechanisms that you think of in terms of pumps and other sort of uh, pathway inhibitor type things. Uh, so this is sort of uh, what I present when I think of theranosis. These are the, um, uh, this is sort of the, the granddaddy of them all, uh, at Sloan Kettle with an antibody linker and so on. This was the first FDA approved agent. Uh, it's basically a calcium mimetic radium to 23 alpha meters of FIGO. And then we have a prostate cancer agent and a neuroendocrine agent. So, um, so why is all this important? Um, um, well, it's really fundamentally different from the way we've been treating cancer. I mean, what I found really interesting is that uh, uh, in oncology, drugs that go to a phase one a trial, meaning that they've passed all the pre preliminary stuff, they've got a 90, they've been approved by the FDA to go into an initial clinical trial evaluation. So of those, 97% uh, of them don't make it into humans as an FDA approved drug. Uh, so the, the success rate is dismal. And there are a bunch of reasons for that. Uh, but you know, we re I really believe that, that the complexity of cancer can account for a big part of that. And this technique is really quite simple in essence. Find a, a targeting vehicle that recognizes a, a cell surface marker, uh, label it with a radionuclide that emits uh, uh, beta particles or alpha particles. And then it's a question of, from the dosimetry aspect, it's a question of where does it go and how long does it stay there? I have this other slide, but I, so I generated this slide in like the last 10 minutes. And I quickly shared it with Lisa. So she's going to be presenting also. So I won't talk about it too much. So I hope everybody knows that I'm joking. I won't talk about it too much. And I'll just stop there. Uh, thanks very much. I I really appreciate that you, you know, your swords into plowshare statement uh, links together the earlier panels that we had today for the NRSB. You know, clearly this development area certainly falls under the Atoms for Peace agenda of long ago, which continues. And I also very much appreciate the fundamental difference of these targeted alpha theranostics uh, against other oncologic drugs. That is really key for understanding as we move forward. Um, to that end, uh, uh, Lisa, it, uh, it, could you explain the current and future developments of these applications in the clinic, since you are right next to the bedside uh, and and the and the beneficial impact on patients overall. Thanks. Well, well, thank you very much. And um, I'm delighted and honored uh, by this invitation to speak to the board today. Um, I'd like to present uh, a, a timeline perspective of uh, um, the introduction of theranostics. The first theranostic that was ever introduced was iodine. We didn't call it as, as such but it was radioactive iodine. So starting from the first experiments of Arthur Roberts and Saul Hertz in the late 1930s, we um, passed to the um, uh, invention of uh, radio-labeled octreotide by Eric Kranning in the early 1990s, who then had the idea of applying uh, um, the same compound for uh, given in high activities for uh, for therapy utilizing and exploiting the OG emit emission to then switch to the use of beta emitters um, first yttrium 90 dot talk then we switched to lutetium dilatate which was the object of the first registration trial uh, for a theranostic agent uh, uh, which led to the approval uh, of lutetium dilatate uh, in the United States in 2018. And then changing years, the approval, uh, uh, the, the randomized study uh, vision trial, which led to the approval of the lesion PSMA 617 in the prostate cancer, uh, metastatic prostate cancer space. And this is what um, uh, George has already said, uh, briefly said, uh, today we have a very busy marketplace. Uh, we have several place, um, players in the field, which is very reassuring for a, for a branch which was almost unknown 25 years ago. And also the market value of Theranostic is, uh, is increasing. Um, 
and uh, the theranostic concept uh, uh, as we as we know it is uh, obviously the fusion of two words one is diagnostic and the other is therapeutic and, and it uh, um, leverages the uh, affinity or the um, affinity of a ligand uh, for a cancer characteristic, like a receptor or an antigen. Um, and uh, uh, this ligand is made radioactive through the um, uh, achelator, which holds either a diagnostic or a therapeutic isotope, thus allowing uh, us to switch from the diagnostic phase to the therapeutic phase and back to the a diagnostic phase for the follow-up. And so there's a so-called theranostic motto where we say we see what we treat and we treat what we see. Um, so, and diagnostic isotopes, uh, gallium, uh, uh, copper, therapeutic isotopes, uh, beta and alpha emitters, which are nowadays more important. And the state of the art at the moment can be um, resumed uh, in uh, neuroendocrine and prostate cancer as uh, uh, the one of, uh, for example, the neuroendocrine efficacious uh, um, tools with uh, tumor responses, symptom relief, uh, reasonably well tolerated. And the same is for, uh, uh, for uh, lutetium PSMA metastatic prostate cancer. But the fundamental problem is that we cannot annihilate, we cannot destroy entirely the tumors, we need a different approach. So where is the field going? The evolution of the field is leading us to uh, new strategies, such as the most immediate one, the combination of uh, uh, beta radiopharmaceutical therapy with chemo biologics, intraarterial routes, the use of new uh, theranostic, for example, the somatostatin receptor antagonists, which have much greater affinity for the somatostatin receptors than the current dotate, uh, new peptides, the FAPI inhibitor, uh, and so on and so forth. But most important is the introduction of the alpha emitters, and that's why we're here today. Why? Because the alpha emitters have been uh, uh, compared to a therapeutic tool that is able to cure the incurable. That's how it has been uh, uh, described. And just let me show you a few examples. This is a patient uh, uh, which was resistant to conventional uh, beta uh, uh, dotatate for, uh, for a neuroendocrine tumor treatment, and uh, uh, the patient responded to actinium 2 to 5 dotatate. So we, in this particular series of patients, the authors were able to observe 63% response rate in patients refractory to conventional beta uh, PRRT. Uh, this is another case, a patient with a, a extreme a pleural invasion by a thymic neuroendocrine tumor that responds beautifully uh, to alpha therapy with actinium dotatoc. And the same has been performed also in, um, in, uh, in patients with prostate cancer, uh, progressing to conventional lutetium PSMA therapy, the patient is virtually cancer-free after the application of actinium 2 to 5. Uh, obviously, uh, that needs a, a tweaking, and we need to define uh, the modalities and the safety uh, profiles of these uh, um, radiopharmaceuticals, but that's why we we're having the discussion uh, in this panel. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. I I appreciate very much the the overall approach of see what we treat and treat what we see, uh, which is exceedingly unique uh, in uh, oncology field in particular, uh, and also the evolution of uh, of the field with new strategies. Of course, adjuvant therapies, uh, radiochemistry development, uh, and and of, of course including alpha emitters. Um, and to, to that uh, fact, I thought we could have uh, Tara discuss radio tracer developments, uh, and perhaps you could give a brief overview of some of the leading candidate radioisotopes. I know Dr. Baudet talked about a few, uh, uh, but those that are, are under development currently. Yes, so... Um... There's a lot being done in targeted alpha therapy right now in the preclinical space. And, you know, like Lisa said, it is uh, having a profound effect on how cancer is treated. And so I think um, 
One of the big things that we're seeing in the preclinical space is we're trying to find ways in which we can deliver that targeted alpha therapy quickly to our target and clear the rest from the body. And so most of the preclinical development is happening in small molecules and peptide world and antibody fragments because of their fast circulation times. There are some um, antibodies that target like uh, trastuzumab, HER2, and things that are being explored. However, with these antibodies, um, they have a longer circulation half-life, and so that can be problematic for the blood and circulation dose um, that people are receiving. Um, as far as the radioisotopes, I think that are most importantly being developed right now is actinium-225, obviously is the leading candidate. Um, but the supply of actinium-225 is difficult, especially in the preclinical space. Um, and uh, we're looking at actinium-225 for a lot of preclinical applications that has a contaminant of actinium-227, which causes some safety hazards. Um, we also have astatine 211, which is much different than all the others that are kind of lumped together in the in its chemistry. So we're making small organic molecules out of astatine 211. Um, and so that's being used primarily for cancer therapy as um, uh, these uh, small molecules that can target these cancers. We have lead 212, which is a, uh, also an alpha emitter. The nice thing about lead 212 is that it has a um, true theranesic pair. So you can get lead 203, which can be used for SPECT imaging. So you can use the lead 203 uh, tracer to image uh, and then the lead 212 to do the alpha therapy. So that's really nice. It's the only um, alpha emitting radionuclide that has a true theranostic dynastic pair associated with it. Um, and also some of these shorter lives, you know, the lead 212, the bismuth 213, we need a radionuclide generator to um, supply these radionuclides. And so there's a lot of development in trying to find radionuclide generators that can actually supply larger quantities for these for clinical applications. This is a huge um, area of need, especially if we're going to see these become go to the clinic and be used in clinical applications. Excellent. Uh, uh, thank you very much for cluing us in overall and appreciate the, the sort of leaning towards smaller molecules, though still certain disease types of uh, monoclonals would make much sense um, overall. Um, Rebecca, may, maybe you could talk about how, I mean, Tara made it seem like it was, uh, you snap your fingers and these all come together. And I, I know as radiochemists, you are uh, spend a good bit of time. Could you describe some of the radiochemistry and some of the potential difficulties, you know, uh, uh, you want them to stick together long enough to do what they need to do, for example, but could you describe a little bit of that and some of the work currently going on? Sure. Um... So let me let me just share one slide. I wasn't going to do this, but I think it's important to show the very wide variety of um, chemicals and isotopes we have available. And so you just heard from uh, all of the panelists, right, we, that we have access to a lot of different isotopes. And um, this is this image is taken from a publication that is already about five year old <laughs> and it's already outdated. Um, however, the reason why I'm showing it is because we have, if we're looking at even just the alpha emitting uh, isotopes, they're elements that are all over the periodic table, right? We're looking at radium, which is an um, alkaline earth metal, all the way to lead, post-transition metal, and acetine, which is considered a halogen. And then we have actinium and thorium that are below in the F element series. So all of those, um, yes, we, we definitely have to consider their radiological properties for um, the application itself. But as radiochemists, we also need to consider the very uh, diverse chemistry, um, which is what we leverage to attach them onto the targeting um, vectors, right? And we we saw 
kind of another version of this, uh, this diagram um, where we have the targeting component, which can be an antibody or a peptide, um, um, some kind of molecule that has a biological activity that will target uh, the cancer cell specifically. We have linkers that are involved and depending on what type of radioisotope we're dealing with, we are going to have a chelating agent if we're dealing with a radio metal or some other um, small molecule that has uh, specific functional properties uh, that we can use to attach something like a halogen, like a iodine or acetine. And so really uh, a lot of the challenges reside in the chemistry of those chelating agents or small organic molecules where we want the radioisotope to bind this entire construct very quickly and very effectively. We want it to be very stable so that we can prepare the clinical formulations, maybe ship them around or prepare them on site, but get them to the patients as stable constructs. We also need the construct to be stable enough in vivo um, during the time it takes to reach its target. And then we we need to be we needed to be able to um, be stable enough to be either removed if it hasn't reached the target or um, or, or really get to where we want it to be. Um, so a lot of the difficulty is in designing the chelating agent for isotopes like radium two two three or actinium two two five or thorium two two seven or designing some uh, labeling strategies for things like acetine two eleven um, and. Uh, making sure we can do this effectively in settings that are appropriate for the clinic. So if you think of a short-lived isotope um, that may need to be prepared on site, if you need um, to go through three to six steps in synthesis, this is not necessarily feasible in uh, the various pharmacies that are available. Um, or if we need to do this, we would rather do it at room temperature and in a few minutes rather than having to heat our um, solutions and have them the reactions last for several hours. So all of this needs to be taken into consideration when we design the radio pharmaceuticals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, recognizing that it's a fast moving field, partially because of the work of, of each of you and folks like you uh, uh, in the nation, um, trying to leverage that diverse chemistry for stably linking uh, with target vectors. So I appreciate that. Um, especially since one of the early degrees was chemistry. So there finally it was, it was nice to see. Thanks. Um, Perhaps George, but really to all of the panels, um, what are the advantages uh, uh, or how would you compare alpha emitters versus beta emitters in, in this field? Uh, you know, are, 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 are some better for certain disease types or, uh, you know, et cetera? You know, there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, alpha therapies are generating very much interest. Uh, could you, you know, could you comment on that? Perhaps start with George, but really any panel member, feel free to jump in. Yeah, Larry, thanks so much, actually. The first couple of slides in pretty much any talk I give are making that contrast. If you think of cancer therapy, we've been using chemotherapy. It kills all rapidly proliferating cancer cells. The big advance in the course of cancer therapy was recognizing that cancer cells rely on molecular signaling to be cancer cells, basically to uh, to shift from a from a sort of physiologic cell to a cell that has uncontrolled and rapid proliferation, and the advance there was identify, identifying these pathways, signaling pathways, and then finding. So this was a whole uh, advance in cancer therapy, realizing that if you can interrupt those pathways, they tell the cell it to, it's, a, it's a cancer cell. That then you could design drugs that interrupt those pathways and stop a cancer cell from being a cancer cell, not necessarily killing it, but preventing it from, from behaving like a cancer cell. And that really had some tremendous success. Uh, you can think of leukemia, uh, 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 BSR able targeting. Uh, this is one of the key pathways, but small molecules, very big changes in first understanding of how cancer works and then taking advantage of that to uh, to treat. Uh, so 
the issue with that is you need to keep delivering these drugs to maintain that that uh, uh, block in the signaling pathway. And cells have, I mean, if I show a picture of the signaling pathways for 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 a certain type of cancer, they have tremendous amount of redundancy. And yes, you can block one pathway, but the agent you're using to block to block it with leads to other effects. Uh, these agents have really tremendous and often unexpected side effects. And eventually over time, cancer becomes resistant to them. So it's an ongoing search for other agents or combination of agents. I'm not saying that things won't be different with ready pharmaceutical therapy, but it's fundamentally different because we go back to a very simple approach. Find a target, um, design a molecule that binds to that target, link link a radioactive atom to that target, uh, and that's it. Uh, then it's a matter of what kind, how much radiation dose are you delivering, uh, and where else is that dose being delivered to? So, and alphas in particular are, I think, as we've been saying, a big change from the past. When you think of external beam radiotherapy, you're delivering photons. They knock off, they knock the electrons around, and that leads to the damage that kills cells through DNA mediated and maybe some other mediated pathways. But with direct delivery of alpha particles, which is uniquely a, a, um, a feature of radio pharmaceutical therapy, internal uh, delivery of um, alpha emitters. We're just starting to learn what this can do. I would say that, so that's the distinction. Mm -hmm. um, and I can stop there. Oh, that's great. Anyone else uh, uh, want to talk a little bit about the distinction, you know, in addition yeah. to those hallmarks of cancer and molecular signaling and how these can go directly there? Yeah, Dr. Uh, Boudet? Uh, yeah, I can, I can elaborate from the clinical standpoint, obviously, it represents a great promise for us. Uh, what we observe when we uh, perform a radiopharmaceutical therapy with uh, beta emitters is that we have a net result. Um, not every uh, net, net result in terms of tumor growth and tumor volume. We apply the treatment systemically. The treatment is uh, uh, deposited uh, thanks to the, you know, the targeting. In the tumors, not every uh, cell is uh, is targeted. Uh, we we need deep uh, micro dosimetric work, um, which hopefully is developing, and um, and the result that we have in clinic is either uh, stability progression or um, response. But it's it's a it, it's a continuum between the the cells that we can kill, the cells that that survive. With alpha therapy, provided we can deliver the whole, um, you know, treatment to the, the the treatment to the whole tumor volume, uh, we can overcome the resistance of the of the tumor cells, and this is testified by the the numerous cases of uh, uh, I like to say curing the incurable because that's exactly how it has been reported. Uh, once we can really deliver the the energy to the majority of the tumor cells, uh, we can obtain very uh, brilliant results, which is what we need to, you know, improve the treatments for our patients. Um, thank you. I, are, are, I know oncology is the key, but uh, has there been discussion of, of any outcomes other than cancer for uh, theranostic uh, relate this, you know, radio pharmaceutical theranostics. Yeah, Rebecca, maybe. Or sure, there there have been several programs looking at applications of radio theranostics for targeting microbial pathogens, bacteria, right, for um, infectious diseases, also to target viruses uh, and fungi. So, you know, I, I think it um, there is a very uh, a lot of opportunities in that space. If you're looking at being able to find a target <laughs> that is specific to uh, the diseased cell or um, the pathogen that you want to target, and then um, preparing a, a, a vehicle, a peptide, a small molecule, an antibody that will get to that target. Um, from for the bacterial infections, what interest one interesting point is again that the, the bacteria may not have the same uh, resistance mechanisms that they may have against um, traditional antibiotics because of uh, the 
the pathways involving radiation and, and destroying the bacterial cells. And so this is, those are, um, there are a lot of research programs at the moment that are exploring uh, going beyond cancers and, and finding appropriate targets. Thank you. And, and Tara, to go back to one of your comments about having a true theranostic pair, you know, I know at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we played with it a little bit, but pet theranostics would really do that, wouldn't it? Because it would be all in one. Of course, they're expensive. Uh, and therein lies part of the part of the big issue. But any comments on that? You know, in other words, having uh, a, the pet agent deliver both the image and, of course, the uh, beta. So I guess what, what I'm assuming you mean is when you have two different isotopes on one ligand. And so one does the diagnostic and PET and one is doing the theranostic and the alpha emitter. And I think that there is a lot of interest in developing those. They are more complicated, especially if you're going to use something like fluorine 18 because um, it's short-lived. You want something that really matches the half-life of what you're of what you're of your treating. So, Right. So for something like actinium, and I think Rebecca did a lot of work with the uh, cerium um, series, it's, you're just trying to find a surrogate that kind of matches the same chemistry, I think, for the longer lived ones where you're going to attach it to a chelate. Great. Thank you. Um, so as the NRSB uh, part of the National Academy system, um, We'd especially be interested to hear from the panel uh, members. What are, in your experience, and really I'd like to go to each one of you, um, what are the known barriers to increased development? We've heard already how important it is, uh, how the development is, is progressed. Each of you, I was interested to hear, have talk, dropped into your comments what a barrier, um, but I'd like to kind of talk about those very, you know, specifically, what are the barriers to increased development, use of theranostics and other radio ph pharmaceutical therapies at this time from your unique perspective? And maybe we could start with the clinic. Dr. Baudet, maybe we could start with you. Sure. Um, I mean, barriers for radio pharmaceutical therapy in general, theranostics more in particular, and even more in particular, the alpha therapies are several. Um, logistics, um, production, distribution. I mean, for example, uh, uh, alpha emitters, uh, their, you know, rarity and uh, uh, preciousness. And, you know, everybody remembers the shortage of actinium earlier this year. Um, uh, storage, distribution, the workforce, uh, the equipment that one needs, uh, not every center can afford that. Um, access uh, um, both to knowledge on behalf of the doctors and access to radiotheranostics on behalf of the patients. Uh, the training of the, of the personnel, of the doctors, of the nurses, of the uh, physicists and everybody. Um, uh, important is the financial viability of this approach because these drugs uh, are now becoming very expensive. Uh, but I also like to point out the attention of the of this group of the board to the biological challenges. So we can produce and generate more radiopharmaceuticals, more radiotheranostics, but in order to be able to maintain the viability of this approach, and uh, which is now very popular and very um, sought after by the the oncologists, we need to. Um, identify the the right target so the we need to apply the principle of precision medicine to apply the, the right treatment in the right dose to the right patient in the right moment so we need to make sure that we ap apply these treatments based on the specific patient uh, dosimetry both for the tumors and the normal organs and the specific specific patients capacity to respond to the treatment or in a, in more technical terms the radio resistance or radio sensitivity of the tissues nowadays uh, dosimetric uh, um, uh, techniques have improved considerably and now allow us to image both alphas uh, betas and we with with precision and with a, a saving of time 
Um, but there are also techniques to measure the radiosensitivity of the tissues, so genomic signatures, and a, a lot of tools that allow us to pre-select the right strategy, either a, a de-intensified de or a, an intensified strategy for those patients with radioresistant tumors. Excellent. We have a lot of work to do. Um, Tara, could you comment uh, from your unique perspective on what some of the barriers are? Yeah, so I think one of the major barriers is availability of these radionuclides. Um, Actinium-225 has a very limited supply clinically, and then you have lots of these companies coming up trying to make Actinium-225, um, and, and it's a challenge. It you requires a radioactive target of radium-226. Radium-226 decays to a gas, radon-222. And so these companies are taking, you know, milligram to gram quantities, depending on which production route they're trying to go through, and they want to irradiate these targets. So making these facilities is not easy. You have to find a way to contain that gas so it doesn't get released into the atmosphere. So, so for actinium-225, also just the availability of radium-226 is an issue for these companies to get a hold of it. Um, and it's a precursor not only for actinium-225, but also for thorium-227 and radium-223. Um, you also have availability concerns for acetine-211. It requires a 30 MeV alpha-emitting cyclotron. There's only a few of those in the country. And so it's a seven-hour half-life. So right now, feasibly, acetine can only exist within a small radius of those facilities. So... That's a problem with acetine. And same thing with lead 212. We have, again, availability concerns with uh, lead 212 as well. Um, another concern, and uh, Lisa kind of touched on it, is training. So as alpha therapy has become more and more popular, more and more research labs at universities want to study it. Um, and, and, and they're used to working with things pet isotopes, right? And the safety concerns with working with a pet isotope and an alpha isotope are completely different. And the annual limit of intake, the amount that you could be exposed to internally for an alpha emitting isotope is orders of magnitude lower than that for a pet isotope. So you have to be very cautious and you really need to be well-trained, especially when we're working with students who may or may not always know you know, the right thing to do. Um, and so I think that's a big part. And then third, another major issue is waste disposal. So right now, um, Actinium-225, the, you know, the pure stuff is mostly going to the clinic. If you want, a lot of universities are taking the, you know, contaminated Actinium-227 variety, which one, is extremely radiotoxic. I believe it's the most radiotoxic um, isotope on in existence. And then two, disposing of actinium-227 is extremely expensive. Even if you don't mix waste, just as a, just plain actinium-227 in its simplest form can be a, a real um, problem for some of these universities to dispose of. So we have to think about that in the development and how do we get access because we can't get things into the clinic if people can't get things preclinically done to prove that it can work to move on to the next stage. Yeah, I, I very much appreciate all of those uh, uh, aspects, uh, not the least of which is uh, the, the availability overall, especially reminding us that the preclinic work has to happen before uh, we, we're in the clinic. Um, sometimes I think of the use of alpha particles as sort of a back to the future kind of thing. You know, historically, at least the big uh, uh, medical centers used radium way back in the day, but that generation of users is no longer in the labs or the clinic. Um, and even, even the regulators uh, are, that regulated radium back in the day are, are not here to regulate alpha and, and it raises a, a, um, issues of training even the regulatory groups. So thanks for those comments. Rebecca, any additional comments with regard to barriers? Currently. Yes, I can only echo what uh, Lisa and Tara have said in terms of supply, training, and waste disposal. I will add um, that in my experience, the, the training is, is really paramount, um, especially in characterizing the isotopes, right? We're, we're seeing more and more um, 
uh, opportunities to supply various isotopes using various uh, nuclear reactions um, that may generate more trace contaminants. And, you know, folks in nuclear medicine departments are not necessarily uh, accustomed to having to determine which trace contaminant are in there, right, depending on whether they're alpha, beta, or gamma emitters. And um, we were just talking about the contamination with actinium-227. Some people may not even know <laughs> that their actinium-225 is contaminated. And so that really is a big issue um, that we start having sources that are unknown and disseminated um, in, in university settings and hospital settings. To, to me, this really represents a, something that we need to address fairly quickly before some incident happens. Yeah, uh, certainly there are institutions who, from a regulatory standpoint, aren't ready for dealing with, for example, an actinium-227 decommissioning funding plan uh, uh, in case uh, they were to close and there were trace contaminants that they had to, to prove were no longer there if, as they decommissioned. So that is significant, in addition to uh, the paramount uh, importance of training overall. George, to, to, to kind of bring this part of the discussion to a close. Anything we've missed as far as uh, uh, barriers? Uh, could you comment even on, say, FDA approval process and the rest? Yeah, absolutely. So a, a couple of uh, sort of kind of quasi-philosophical points. Larry, you pointed to prior experience with alpha emitters. Alphas have a bad rap. And I would say, again, just to think through kind of on a, on a bigger scale, the fact that we're having this, this discussion in a session that talks about nuclear waste and protection and how to deal with, with things like that really highlights one of the barriers to this field. It's, we're not having in the context of cancer therapy and the good aspect. So all the language related to the symmetry is hazard. You know, what are the hazards of this stuff? And if I think we need to focus on what are the benefits. If you think of chemotherapy, tremendously toxic. Uh, who knows what the what the waste products do in our environment? So I would flip the thing and think more about the the therapeutic benefits. Uh, and in terms of what are the barriers to therapeutic benefits, putting aside availability, which we've talked about. Uh, so I think key to all this is one of the questions on the board, which is can we have a target against pancreatic cancer? So a a technical barrier number one is is expanding the molecules that, that can be used to target cancer cells. And in principle, that's completely doable. Right now we can target um, um, neuroendocrine and, and uh, prostate as Lisa showed. There's no reason why we can't uh, do pancreas. And in fact, there are some agents that are moving towards that direction. We can target breast cancer, name the cancer, and there's no reason for, for us not to be able to target it. In fact, there are some agents like FAPI that Lisa uh, pointed to that could be pan-cancer targeting. They target the environment of the cancer cell, which is potentially um, uh, available to all cancers. So we'll see how that goes. It's very early days. Uh, the other barrier I would point out, and we've seen it happen, is that these agents are thought of as oncology agents. So they're going, they start out in the hands of medical oncologists. They're tested in the medical oncology regime. And with chemo and all these other therapeutics, the standard regimen is uh, in cycles, you administer, you wait six weeks, you administer again, you wait six weeks. And that, that cycling approach is derived just because that's what they're used to. Radiobiologically, I don't see much sense to that. I think that we need to really look at that aspect, take a, take a dosimetry aspect to that. No other cancer treatment gives you the opportunity to see where you, we've talked about this, to, to look at where your treatment regimen is going and to just right off the bat adopt something that's used in all these different, for different, for a peptide and for a small molecule, by the way. And both of them are delivered with the same amount. So we need to, one of the barriers is thinking about how to administer this modality. If we compete uh, without taking advantage of the symmetry and imaging, which is what we're doing for the most part right now. We're going to lose it. It'll be a lot easier for the medical oncology community to take to take drugs that aren't radioactive, that have a shelf life that's infinite, basically. Um, the other, you know, the, I would like to point to some trials where 
if you take that approach and deliver the agents in, in a med on kind of way, you end up sort of uh, losing out because there are trials that um, that do these comparisons and basically show equivalence. And we're selling ourselves short. There's a big risk that because of the way these things are being inappropriately delivered to patients, conclusions will be reached that they're not they're not as good as the other things could be. So yeah, so it's my sort of philosophical list of areas. Oh, no, thank you. The, those are exceedingly important. Ju Julian Preston, I see you have your hand up. Yep. Yeah, I had a, uh, I had a hand up. I, uh, my background is in uh, in biology, and I fully appreciate the, uh, the real sophistication of the approach and the specificity of the approach, but I'm just getting a little concerned now hearing all these barriers. I mean, is there any way to overcome these barriers to actually make this a a, a regular approach to cancer therapy? Yeah. Any panel, uh, Rebecca? Yeah. Maybe I can I can answer this from the the chemical perspective, right? If if you have a selected isotope, let's say we decide actinium two two five is really the holy grail in terms of of alpha therapeutics, um, and you have a chelator and the linker for which the chemistries are established. Um, there are methods where you wanted to use one antibody or another antibody depending on your target, right? Those could be very well transferred from a peptide to an antibody to another one. So you could imagine that in the future you have a platform where you have your chelator um, and your radioisotope. And depending on the cancer you want to target, you may use one or another antibody, but then the chemistry is the same. Um, and so you, you could probably diversify those therapies fairly easily. Um, Lisa, would you like to comment from a clinical standpoint too? Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, we, we probably painted the, 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 the scene to, we, 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 you know, uh, with a little bit of pessimism, we, it's not uh, because we need to be aware. And I think the important thing is to maintain um, um, in this experience of uh, development of theranostics uh, and expertise in nuclear oncology, this, uh, you know, it's too easy, as George mentioned, uh, to to skip the, the imaging phase. I, I see a lot of, uh, you know, peripheral centers who are engaged in standard of care theranostics. Oh, we're not imaging the patients afterwards. So why why would we do that? And then one step leads to the next. And then it, it something that can be seen before a, uh, uh, you know, before and during the treatment uh, is not imaged anymore and is treated like any other chemotherapeutic agent. And uh, all of a sudden we discover that patients are treated as it happened uh, in, cer in certain protocols with resulting absorbed doses to the tumors of two grays for a full cycle of, of, uh, of treatment with several, uh, you know, with, with a huge amount of uh, radioactivity. So we can't let this happen because we will lose the field. So that that's the important thing to maintain an expertise of nuclear oncology to perform the symmetry and also to, you know, to be uh, aware. And this is the, I, I guess, another topic of uh, toxicity and potential scavenging techniques. Thank you. Uh, uh, Don Frush, uh, Dr. Frush. Yes, thanks. Yes, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hold on, let me. All right, I'll get there. I'm, I'm <laughs> technically challenged. Um, this is more a comment, and uh, I'll say that I'm a radiologist, so I I'm, I would say not familiar with the topic, but recognize it's important. I'm also a seasoned radiologist. I guess it's a good word for old. And so the um, people coming up are going to be much more familiar with this. And I'll get back to this in just a second. But I want to thank you all for, for this presentation. Um, I, I guess it's like a barbershop quartet and that the fact that you complimented each other in the discussions was really remarkable. And thank you, Larry, for curating this. You were the right person to to do it. Um, and and um, Julian sort of touched on this. It's it's an extremely complex medical topic, but it's incredibly valuable. And it, and, and as I think about it, um, and this is kind of tongue in cheek, but really the American Board of Medical Specialties needs to carve out a Theranostics 
part now, whether that lives in radiology and nuclear medicine or not, but um, it just seems that to bring all these various specialties together, which involves interventional radiology, it involves surgery, potentially pathology, palliative care, oncologists, is, is becoming increasingly difficult to really distill and, uh, and, and focus on the value of this. So I do, I do say partly, you know, and having been on boards ABR before, I know it's, it's challenging to do this, but it really is a compliment to the advances in the field. And, and I, and I say that that kind of pathway needs to be considered because it gets back at this thing. Who, who will own this? How does NRSB talk to individuals about, about the issues of radiation protection, about doses and so on? And right now it's sort of a disparate uh, network of people who do this, but to have sort of a, 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 a designated subspecialty in this area, I think would make that pathway of communication so much easier. Yeah, absolutely, Don. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Baudet. Yeah, well, uh, just uh, one of my hats uh, that I also wear is uh, I'm, I'm one of the members of the board of directors of the American Board of Nuclear Medicine. And uh, yes, I totally agree with your comment. Um, uh, th there, there needs to be uh, mm, there needs to be some consolidation. But the board of nuclear American board of nuclear medicine, you know, reunites the the, the knowledge and dispenses the knowledge on theranostics. And uh, you know, our uh, diplomats are uh, required to have knowledge of theranostics. And th the knowledge uh, has been increasing uh, over the years. And uh, the questions that, uh, that are posed to our, um, our diplomats are now uh, increasingly about uh, theranostics. Yeah, ex excellent. Uh, George? Yeah. Yeah, I would say uh, there is a diversity of people involved. And I think critical to all that is to have physicists engaged at an equal level because this is ultimately a, a, a radiation absorbed dose delivery modality. And I think the medical community is, is not really trained to, to deal with how, how to calculate and, and absorb doses. So it's gotta be a partnership with physicists and, uh, you know, and, and uh, nuclear medicine people. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tara and Rebecca, could you could you comment uh, speaking about roles because Don Don that was great um, on on the roles uh, th there are so many different roles that need to come to the table for this to be successfully uh, borne out in at least in the nation, but what role do do you see the U.S. national labs have? You know, I, I heard a number of the labs mentioned. Uh, but could you specifically talk about uh, Theranostics development currently and maybe what you'd like to see the labs be doing? Yes, so um, <laughs> I think we see a lot of focus on isotope production in the national labs at the moment. Um, this is one of the missions of the U.S. Department of Energy to make sure we have a consistent supply of needed radioisotopes. Um, and so we have seen in the last 15 years, lots of efforts directed towards finding new methods for radioisotope productions that are relevant to the medical community. Um, we have three national labs that are very involved in production uh, efforts the Brookhaven, Los Alamos, and Oak Ridge National Labs. And they partnered to not only produce the isotopes, but, but purify them and make them available to the community. And more recently, we've had Pacific Northwest, Berkeley Lab, um, other labs just involved in making, for example, generators for lead 212, or just developing new methods and um, new ways to make those isotopes more available. Uh, I would say in the past five years, we have seen increased interest in the national labs um, to bridge the, the gap between isotope production and um, pharmaceutical development, right? Um, all of the, the chemistry aspects are 
starting to be of interest to the scientific community that is in that DOE complex. So we see new efforts in developing chelators, for example, out of Oak Ridge or Livermore or Berkeley. Um, so there, there is a, a growing community of researchers that is interested in that topic. And because they are part of the national labs, they have access to the isotopes maybe more easily. Um, and so I think what ideally we could see in the next 10 to 15 years is really an established network bridging production to chemical efforts, to radiopharmaceutical development and um, collaborations with uh, not, not just the clinics, but uh, university hospitals and medical schools as well, and, and other universities that are interested in, in, in that field. Um, another aspect that is important to the development is all the preclinical work, right? Um, we, we don't have so many facilities in the U.S., but especially in the national labs where you can do in vivo preclinical work with those isotopes. Um, so I think some efforts in addition to isotope production and streamlining the studies that are needed to develop new radiopharmaceuticals would be useful for the researchers, for the clinicians, for dosimetry studies, um, um, functioning as a, a CRO, if you want. I think that the national labs are very well positioned to do this. So hopefully we'll we'll see that evolve. Tara, any additional? Thanks. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, additional yeah. thoughts uh, on how how the nation as a whole could do this? Yes, I know that uh, it definitely the national labs, like she said, are more focused on the production and even now chemistry, but also they are starting to try to bridge that gap between the in vivo and in vitro work with spheroids and tumor on the chip models because uh, they can't have access to animals. But I think a lot of like Oak Ridge is doing that and they're reaching out to universities to then take their stuff to the animal level. So, you know, the more that they reach out to the universities and get some collaborations going, I think that's good. And I also think that, again, like I said, as targeted out therapy becomes more and more um, popular, getting more and more university personnel trained appropriately so that they can train their students appropriately is what's really going to help to move this forward and also availability. Again, unless these things become more available at a cheaper cost, right now it's kind of exclusive to certain groups uh, because of that. Excellent, excellent point. Um... In all of the areas of alpha theranostics and theranostics as a whole, um, is there a developing role for machine learning and AI in play? Uh, where should that go? Uh, you know, trying to transition from the bench to the clinic, you know, preclinical work to the clinic. Um, and anyone like to comment on that? Or are we still in the development stage? Like that's too far or perhaps in the selection of the right dose for the right patient at the right time. Um, any comments from the panelists? Yeah, so I, I would say that uh, one of the burdens is that to do the dosimetry appropriately, the patient has to come back multiple times for imaging. And there's a lot of effort to figure out how AI can be incorporated into reducing the number of times that the patient has to come back. So that's one area that I think is really quite prominent. I wanted to make one quick comment about the, the previous two speakers. So when you think of uh, doing preclinical radiopharmaceutical therapy, it'd be great if we had a core lab that could accommodate radioactive samples. I'm doing mouse studies in my lab. And I mean, to count, to do a CBC study, yeah, I have to have my own counter. The cores won't take anything radioactive. Tissue samples, we've got to do everything ourselves. If we could have some kind of program to recognize that these studies require all of the stuff that is, you know, gene count, whatever, all of the stuff that is done for regular biology, but that, ha that has to be radioactive. That would be a great, I mean, we would all benefit, pre the preclinical people would, would really have, see that as a huge blessing. Would you foresee yeah. that, uh, you know, as a, in, a, a, an academic, medical academic kind of consortium? I mean, how would you envision that? 
You know, that's a good question. I, I, I almost think it's got to be on site because, well, uh, the question is, how long can you wait for these things to stop being radioactive? And that's yeah. a moving uh, target. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how that would work. As, so you're thinking of sort of some central facility that you could send samples to. That adds a whole bunch of, you know, the samples are biological refrigeration and all those things come into play. Yeah. And any other comments on that really good point about um, core labs for processing? Yeah, Rebecca? I will fully concur with that comment. <laughs> um, I think, you know, you could envision either a central lab um, that, that could provide the services or a consortium of, of university labs that work together across the country. Um, where you limit shipments, but I, we could, you know, an inspiration would be from the, the centers for uh, the development of countermeasures against uh, irradiation that is um, spearheaded by NIH, the NIAID institutes. Um, I think there are, there are models of collaborations and consortia that could be applied to, um, to, to this topic. Uh, one one comment, being a a corporate radiation safety officer as well as you know in the physics is, it's interesting. Do labs wonder on the chemotherapy little trace amounts, uh, or is that they don't worry about that? Uh, and and perhaps there's a there's a different issue on radiophobia and this back to the future piece that perhaps we could overcome and might really streamline things a, a little bit better. In fact, uh, Dr. Baudet, do you, have you ever experienced patients or staff who push back on the radiation word or, yes. and, and how, you know, how is that managed in the clinic? Well, first, let, let me say that I've, I've seen it also as a learning curve. So when we introduced uh, um, uh, lutetium dotatate uh, among the, you know, GI oncology community, there was a lot of pushback. I mean, a lot of concern and, as it happens, uh, I've seen the same in Europe 25 years ago. Um, the, the, the patients that were referred for uh, PRT were the, the most end stage, the most compromised. Mm -hmm. And yet the treatment was efficacious in those patients as well. Now the, the clinicians have acquired confidence in this approach. So now the radiophobia on behalf of the clinician is decreasing. We've seen the same with prostate, although, you know, the experience with neuroendocrine tumors cut down on the timing of the so-called learning curve on radiophobia. With patients, we see it quite frequently. Um, and that's why we have an approach where we stay in the room, at least for the first treatment. Sometimes we, we talk to them. And, uh, and, and as you know, all the, also the radiation sure. safety officers are there. Uh, and we talk amiably uh, of anything but uh, what you know, disease and symptoms and everything, and, and it's not infrequent that the patient asks, "So when are we starting?" And and we say, "Well, we just finished." Um, so uh, sometimes we do encounter radiophobia on behalf of personnel when patients, um, personnel who is not directly involved in a radiopharmaceutical therapy, when patients for some reason end up in another facility. But usually, our you know, you know, an experienced radio radiation safety office uh, uh, handles things, uh, you know, properly. Great. I, I just had one, this is an incredible discussion. We could continue discussing. I had one last question for myself, and then of course we could open it to NRSB members. Um, but I was thinking that, could, is there any, are there any approaches for gene or cell-based theranostics? Um, underway um, or, you know, some kind of surrogate imaging um, for the molecular pathways themselves. Perhaps George, maybe you might comment on that. Oh, you're muted. Yeah. There was a huge effort back when people were realizing that you could block these pathways. There was a huge effort to uh, things like, uh, and a lot of this was, was uh, some people at Sloan Kettering, uh, to to develop pet tracers that could go and assess to what extent um, a particular pathway is being blocked by a particular drug. So um, things like, I think, uh, uh, the whole sort of uh, IUDR-based approach is where they were tagging a 
a DNA uh, replication marker to a particular pathway and, and then tagging. So really initially it was all fluorescent imaging and then it moved to, um, to PET-based uh, tracers. But yeah, that's that's been done and that's sort of in a sense uh, unrelated to, I would say unrelated to uh, the theranostics overall ther and radiopharmaceutical therapy in particular. Yeah, I should say I'd, I'd like to make a distinction between theranostics and radiopharmaceutical therapy. I see theranostics as the idea that you can take the same uh, targeting agent, put put an imaging thing on top of it. Yeah, and, and the theranostic image is, is the one you take to uh, assess eligibility of the patient. Does this patient have the targets that I need to to uh, deliver my therapeutic thing? But in radiopharmaceutical therapy you can actually image the treatment as it's happening. And that's where the dissimilarity comes in. Uh, so those are, I see those are two. This I mean, I find with the general umbrella of theranostics, but they are two distinct things. All right. Thank you very much. Good distinction to, to make. Any questions from the other members of the NRSB? Otherwise, I will ask one. Um, you discussed some tandem therapies, Dr. Bode. Uh, what what are the ones that that appear to um, you know that people are thinking the most about? Um, at the moment, uh, the most uh, the most discussed tandem therapies are with uh, PSMA imaging. PSMA, sorry, theranostics, and um, particularly this is an approach that was uh, developed in Germany where PSMA therapy uh, has been developed, and patients are uh, usually started with, uh, you know, metastatic prostate cancer. Is uh, patients are usually started with lutetium PSMA, and then after two cycles, um, it is considered that uh, the efficacy of the treatment would declare itself. And if the treatment is not being efficacious, then patients are um, switched to alpha-based PSMA therapy, for example, with actinium-225. And this approach has allowed to mitigate uh, the profound xerostomia that was noted in several patients uh, treated with just actinium-225 uh, PSMA. So tandem approach, beta uh, and alpha, for example, are frequently uh, adopted to, um, to mitigate the side effects. Uh, it has been done the same, although it's not very, um, very popular yet in the US, but it's been done the same in Europe for actinium dotate or bismuth dotate. This the, the major effector in that case would be the marrow. And it has been noted that patients treated with just actinium dotate have a very um, limited and, and narrow uh, therapeutic window. So in those cases, uh, also uh, the researchers and the, you know, in, in Germany particularly have adopted this uh, tandem strategy, lutetium plus actinium or bismuth. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else want to uh, comment on adjuvant or uh, dual therapeutic approaches? Uh, yeah, I think I think the combination of alpha and beta emitter that Lisa mentioned is tremendously valuable. In one case, you're targeting larger diseases. With the alphas, you're really targeting the, the very small micromets. The other thing I would say is it, these are all these agents are wonderfully uh, combined with external beam radiotherapy. Yeah, but to do that, you really need to have a, a dose map, and you need to sort of not just take the chemo approach and say, okay, I'll deliver this much chemo on a milligram, whatever, per kilogram basis, and then throw in the external beam. But we have the opportunity in, in our case to generate absorbed dose maps and deliver them to the RADOC medical physicists and come up with a combined treatment modality that is based on absorbed dose delivery. So that the treatment plan for the external beam considers the nuclear medicine delivered. Um... Absolutely. Yes, exactly. Both on the tumor target and on the normal. It's interesting. The normal tissue is going to be pretty minimal because with external beam, you're targeting the tumor. And unless you have an agent that binds to something really uh, 
really nearby. So yeah, no, exactly right. That's that's exactly right, uh, Larry. I'd, I'd like to thank the panel and give you one last chance to perhaps talk about for a minute or two anything that we have missed that we should have brought up uh, uh, in, in this in this field. Uh, Tara? Yeah, so one thing I did miss, and I think when I heard Lisa say it, and I, I want to say the need for appropriately trained health physicists. Um, there's a severe shortage of health physicists in this country. And if this modality is going to keep going and increasing, going everywhere, we really need appropriately trained health physicists that can handle work with this kind of material to, to survive. Amen. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, George, last thoughts? Anything we missed? I, I think we've covered everything, actually. I, this has been wonderful. I, I can't thank you enough, Larry, for putting this together. And yeah, also, yeah. wonderful panel of speakers. This has been just really wonderful. I think we, I hope we've stirred up enthusiasm amongst the community. Yeah. I, I guess, no, I don't have any comments, except I just did. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Rebecca? Any any last comments? Yeah. I don't know that we've missed anything, but I would want to emphasize um, the multidisciplinarity of this field, right? We really need participation from biologists, chemists, physicists, um, I, radiation detection focused people. I it, it really spans a very large uh, amount of expertise and skills and and so I think it's it's worth emphasizing because we need to train people um in deeply in in their fields but we also need to make sure they have a broad view of um of various aspects in order to to push this forward thank you very much uh Doc, Dr. Baudet Lisa and could you also uh give us some sense in this country of you know what what's the volume of patients who could benefit from i mean are we talking you know in you know like like tens of thousands of millions of some you know can you kind of clue us in on well on the the the, the tremendous benefit in some way yeah brush broad brush Br brush so obviously with the uh, caveats that we all highlighted that this treatment, this type of treatments should remain with a strong core of nuclear and physic um, uh, experience and knowledge. Um, there are several new radiopharmaceuticals that are being developed for the big killers. So um, we already reached a big killer with prostate, um, um, uh, PSMA, uh, targeting agents for metastatic prostate cancer, the fact that there are several studies that are enlarging, aiming to enlarge and enlarging the label or the FDA approved label um, will probably enlarge the population that are um, of patients that are treated with this uh, approach or will be treated. New diagnostics, maybe FAPI, maybe FAPI, uh, improved FAPI um, tracers like the um, dimeric homo or, or heterodimeric FAPI tracers or the uh, integrin tracers or other uh, radiopharmaceuticals will target the big cancers. So like, you know, the big killers, the lung, uh, then they are targeting. Uh, FAPI is a uh, ample broad spectrum and kind of tracer uh, pan from, from pancreas to sarcomas to melanomas to breast cancers. Um, and at that point, if we perform the right studies and we try to, uh, another important point for uh, uh, radiopharmaceutical therapies to try to answer un unmet needs, not just to diffuse the radiopharmaceutical in, in spaces where there's a plethora of, of other treatments. So th that, that, that is not a, a viable strategy. Uh, we need to answer unmet needs. And then uh, we're, we're talking about, um, uh, I don't know how many, I cannot quantify, but we, we, we will have a, a major expansion, uh, probably at the same level of the current volume of chemotherapy or biotherapy or similar to.
yeah, certain, absolutely. certain chemotherapies or biotherapies. Yeah, very much appreciated. Well, I, I thank you all. Uh, uh, it's been an honor to get to spend an hour and a half with you, with you in this manner. Uh, I only wish we were all together face to face, perhaps the next time. Uh, but thank you very much. And I'll turn back to Charles. Yep. Thanks very much, Charles. Thank you, Larry, and thank you all the panelists. This, like George said, has been a wonderful experience. It's a lot to build on. Uh, we'll, you know, be, be following up as uh, the the board and staff have a chance to really discuss uh, the implications, especially tomorrow when we're back in closed session. So, thank you so much.